Wide Ocean with Jeff Norton on the Paranormal State Radio Network. That's right, Andrew. It is the Midnight Ocean Radio Show and a podcast coming to you live from the great state of Florida, from the nature coast, to your home, to your office, to your car, to your headset, to wherever you may be listening to us on. I want to say thank you for joining us tonight. We have a very special show for you. I don't like doing this. I like I don't like to be so unpredictive. Unpredictive is that the word? No. <laughs> we'll go with it though. It's my show. But we have a little change of plan with our guest. We're going to have uh, Brooke Agnew is going to be joining us here. That is Brooke Agnew is going to be joining us here in the bottom of the hour. But right now we have actually I got a phone call earlier today. From Joseph Reyna, Five Fingers. And we, he has uncovered something that I think everybody needs to be made aware of. It's kind of scary stuff. So for those young people that are out there, mom and dad, if you're letting your young kids listen, you might want to distract them for a little bit as I bring Joseph Reyna on. The other thing, too, is it's very important that we have some documents. If you can join us on Facebook for a few minutes, I highly recommend that you do that. We have some documents that were provided to us. It's from the FBI's website, their own website. And we're going to share those documents with you uh, as part of this. So, so Joseph, Joseph, five, 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 are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, I can. Sorry about that, and I, and uh, and everything. I got your documents, and what I want to do, I, I'm just going to go ahead and put those over here. Now, uh, for those that are on Facebook, or not on Facebook, but on uh, on uh, in the uh, YouTube, I have to get with it here because this is a little bit out of my my pace here, what we normally do. So please bear with me. I am going to put the link to these documents right here on YouTube so everybody can see it and share along with us as you talk. But I do have them up there in YouTube, but they are hard to read, obviously, because they are, you know, you're, you're seeing a browser window, but they do exist. and <laughs> You can go go to them uh, and, and watch them. So, so five. When we were talking earlier today, you you know when you called me and 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 everything, you were given a message that needed to get out there. And I'm just going to shut up and let you talk to our audience because I think this is very important and, and they need to hear this. So go ahead. It's all yours. It's all your microphone. Thanks, Jeff, and thanks for having me on your show. I, I really didn't want to give this information out. I had shared it with you so, so we could see what would happen. But the more I researched it, the more uh, people seem to be having these, these dreams of uh, this event happening. Anyway, we do a lot of interesting meditations, my girlfriend and myself. She can see these, um, I guess, beings that show up, and I can feel them. But uh, she she's actually was um, hearing them the last few times. And uh, that was really unusual, kind of took us by surprise. But one of these beings, she described it, and I said, that's, that's one of the beings I've been trying to make contact with. And she said, well, it has a message for you. And it's saying that um, this is going to be a, a cataclysm just in about a couple of months. And um, we'd never received any kind of warning like that. And it was very specific. It said it would be earthquakes and meteorites. Uh, possibly asteroids, and the time frame it gave was um, roughly now, uh, the end of September and the middle of October, right through there. That would have been about two months, and um, I didn't really, I just kind of kept it on the back burner, see if anything would materialize, and then a few other articles started surfacing and uh, tracked them down. It seems uh, that there's some credibility to them, but it's very possible that we might see some uh, meteorite strikes, uh, substantial meteorite strikes over the this coming weekend. 
Um, hopefully, it won't be anything major or tragic, but this uh, little being was very concerned and it uh, suggested that we should live in a much sturdier house than the one we were in, hmm. which I thought was funny because that's, it was cons- considerable for uh, most homes here in the U.S. and uh, on solid rock up in the hill country of Texas. So anyway, I, I just thought that was interesting. Yeah. There was another one that, that gave another warning before that, and um, that one said, war is coming. So that one I, I didn't mm-hmm. really want to share either, <laughs> but I prayed about it and said, just, just get that information out there. Yeah, which, you know, Joseph, and so, so you know what, what is weird. All right, so the reason, okay, so I can hear the, I can hear the eyes rolling in the heads of, in our listeners and some of them that, that are still getting on board with this. What is weird? And I believe in, I, I believe that there's no such thing as coincidences. Um, I actually received, and I wish I would have saved it because I know a lot of you guys are going, Oh, yeah, Jeff, whatever. But l- let me tell you, I received, and I've never received one of these before ever in, in the whole history. And this is even when I was doing, uh, my political talk radio, which, I was, I knew that I was being monitored. I knew that things were, you know, being watched and, and, and because I was told, <laughs> I was flat out told, uh, from legal counsel that, Hey, look, you know, this going to let you know, this is what's going on. And if you continue down this path, you know, they're going to look at every aspect of your life and dig things up. And, and if you have anything hidden that you don't want dug up, you, you know, you need to let me know, let me get ahead of it you know, for, as your attorney. Well, so, I mean, I've had experiences with the guy, but I've never had this in my life. I got a message through Facebook and it, and normally when you get a message in Facebook, you will get a message and it will tell you who it's from. And this message came from Facebook on, on the instant messaging. And it said, unknown, the individual. The person that sent it, it said unknown. And now there's no unknown user in Facebook because that was the first thing I checked to see if someone was smart enough to have a a user named unknown. (laughs) And there was none. And basically it said, look up to the sky this weekend because you will see the meteorites. That's exactly what the message that was sent to me through my mess, my, my Facebook messaging. That is what they sent to me. So it was weird because I saw, you know, when when we do these shows, we tend to, how do you say, we we meet very interesting people. And so I really didn't, I, I thought it was strange, the fact that it was unknown. That's what really kind of tripped me out was the, 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 I'm getting this message from someone who obviously circumvented Facebook's security, or maybe, I don't know, they might might have been part of Facebook, a developer or something who has that ability to, to send out those types of messages. But the, the message clearly was, look at the night sky, you know, over the weekend because of the, for the meteorites. And, and then all of a sudden, today, I had the guess that we were going to have on here, her all... That did not work out. We there was there was actually a conflict where he's actually in the Netherlands and we're going to record his show tomorrow morning and there was some confusion there. So I'm sitting there trying to figure out how we're going to fill the guests and then lo and behold, Joseph, you call me out of the blue and you give me the same exact message that I got from Facebook. And hence, that is why you're on. And, and also then from there, you know, you, you, we were able to, and I want to say thank you for helping us line up tonight's guest. But it is, I, I, you, there's two people, and, and so the audience knows, in full disclosure, Joseph, since you did the show, you and I have not had any contact with each other, except I think during email, we were like, hey, how are you doing kind of stuff, Correct. Correct. Yeah. I mean, we weren't, you know, you weren't sending me information. You weren't saying, hey, look, this is the, me- this out of the book. Because I want our audience to understand that. I get a message 
Let's lay out the timeline. I get a message from an unknown individual through Facebook that said, you know, that tells me to worry about or look up at the night sky over the weekend and there'll be, you know, I'll see meteorites. You have these visions and then you call me out of the blue and and share this information with me, which I said, look, and I appreciate you coming on the air because I know you were a little hesitant to do that. Uh, but for you to come on the air and, and tell everybody. So I, I it's just uh, there's something definitely going on here. And I've heard, you know, the other thing, too, is I had Dr. Michael Heiser on the on the uh, show last week. And he actually mentioned something offhand about the, uh, you know, on the 23rd, don't worry about it. You know, September 23rd. I, I really didn't know what he meant by that, but I believe there's some event that's supposed to be happening on the 23rd. There's a mass conscious event that people have been reporting, having dreams and stuff, that something's going to happen on the 23rd. And Dr. Michael Heiser said, don't, you know, he, he offered, I didn't ask him about it. He actually said off the cuff, oh, by the way, don't, don't, uh, don't worry about the 23rd, which now I'm worried about the 23rd. (laughs) I'm really worried or concerned about the 23rd. So, yeah, I I wouldn't worry about it too much um a while back do you remember when the u.s was preparing they were getting all those vehicles ordered and the Correct. people trained with um, semi-automatic weapons all government regular government employees and uh, all those food um, packets being sent to schools up in the dc area region one i think they called it anyway they were expecting meteorites to strike then and uh, napolitano had had stepped down and she mentioned we would have a cataclysm in the coming future and it would be cosmic in nature do you remember that i i no i do not i mean she actually said that she actually said it we're going to have an event and it's going to be cause it would be the worst cat catastrophic event in the u.s I, and she was stepping down i never heard that the no. uh, cia director i think it was woolsey said something similar to that really so we're gonna yeah. have to definitely be digging that up well at that time, I, I do believe I am in contact with a particular group, and I was demanding they move those out of the way. When com- Comet Sighting Spring went by, if you look at its trajectory through space, Earth passed right through it, and DC was right in the crosshairs. So if there was debris, they were expecting something to strike. So anyway, I just I demanded, uh, hopefully, they, I mean, it's happening, I don't know, um, that they remove anything that would do damage like that, get it out of the way. And I was kind of laughing about it because if it were true and it did happen, then the U.S. can't scream foul because these objects don't exist out there and they have no ability to move anything out of the way. So nothing happened. There were there was no strike, no asteroids. Gotcha. Uh, nothing occurred that year. The other thing was that um, in Bible code, which I find fascinating, uh, there is something to do with the asteroid. Meetings with asteroids is the way it's, uh, or uh, engagements with asteroids. And it's dated for the year seven five seven seven six, which is this year, 2016, ending um, October 1st. Mm-hmm. And uh, specifically the month of March, the month of Tishir, I think they pronounce it. Anyway, that's, uh, that was a warning in, in Bible code concerning asteroids yeah. striking yeah. the Earth. Yeah, that's Tishra. Uh, is Tishra, Tishra. Okay. yeah, is the, is the Jewish is the Jewish term? Yep, Tishra. So, wow. You yeah, know, I was I wasn't aware of that at the time. Yeah, I, I've never been a big fan of like predictive or anything, you know, predictions and stuff like that because you people you know tend to use that. Of course, if nothing happens, every I'm gonna my mailbox will be full on the on the twenty <laughs> on the twenty stuff. as on yeah. the twenty fourth. And it's it, and then they and then they use that. They go, oh, see, this guy is, it, it, you, you know, this guy is just pushing doom and gloom. Yeah, but, this um, just this afternoon, since I got off the phone with you, I started going through the internet and came across a tremendous amount of people having dreams about yes. asteroid striking. Also saying it's it's now 
And one individual said this was his last recording. He had his bug out bag and he was actually in tears saying, um, sorry, guys, uh, I don't see any way out of this. This is what I'm being shown. And, and I don't think I have any more to add yeah. to it. Yeah. So uh, the other thing I wanted to mention yes. was that I wanted to show people how to track the IP addresses in their phones so they can see if they're being monitored by the government yeah, yeah hold on one second one second so i do want it because i have the i have the ufo documents that you gave me on the fbi from the fbi's website for those that are not on you that are not on youtube please please go out and watch the show on youtube because you can see the documents this is coming you pulled these documents and i'm looking right at the fbi's freedom of information act the page that they they're required to maintain by federal law and i am looking right at a fbi document it says director of the fbi and sac seattle and portland urgent flying disc security matter x lieutenant colonel of course is redacted of g2 san francisco advised today he has no further information and that our Seattle office is in the possession of all information known by him and is handling the matter at Tacoma, Washington. And then, and then you go down to the next page and this is the disclosure, the, the next page. It says this memorandum is reportedly addressed to, to certain scientists and distinction and important area, not military authorities. Part of a disc carrying crew, other and under remote control. Their mission is is peaceful. The visitor contemplate settling in on this plane. These visitors are human like, but mu much larger in size. This is actually you guys got to read that. This is coming from the FBI's freedom. Of inf a FOIA request that was produced, and they had to produce these documents. Now, I know the United States Air Force has a disinformation group <laughs> that is out there, but I just, you know, like I said, people, you got to read these documents. We, we put the link out there. It's out there on the YouTube, and you can see it yourself. And you can make your own determination is if you think it is true or real. But why would the FBI either one or two things? This is true. This document, Joseph, that you sent us is a true document. Well, it is a true document, but it does exist. But in the sense that it's true in what they're discussing is real. Or B, it is disinformation. And why would the government, where, when does the government have time? That would be my thing as a taxpayer. When do they have time? When do FBI agents, when, especially when you got people blowing up pipe bombs and everything in cities and you got all sorts of things going on, when do they have time to produce this junk? It, you know, and it's, it's just crazy. You have to ask yourself. So I do ask that my listeners go out there and the, and share this information. And we did post it in the live data in the, in the chat room on the YouTube page itself. So, you know, we, we asked you guys to get out there and take a look at that. So without further, all right. So now the next thing is Joseph, you were talking about, you had suspicion that you were being monitored by the, by the government on your cell phone and, and you did some investigation and you have discovered a way and you want to share that with the listeners, a way that you can find out where your phone calls are going or who's monitoring your cell phone. So sorry to cut you off on that one, but I wanted to get this document taken care of. And then now let's talk about your cell phone. This is interesting because I, 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 I didn't know, with all my technology ability, I didn't know how to do it. So, Joseph, without, can you explain how, how I, as a listener or a user, can see if my cell phones are being interrupted by the government? Sure. Uh, do we have enough time before the next break? It'll take about three, four minutes. No, we got plenty of time. I'll, I'll just blow the break. I, I'll just blow through the break. It's no big deal. Okay. On your cell phone, you go to the page where you dial out. And you want to write this down. You'll put the star symbol, then 3001. So it's star 3001, pound sign, 
one, two, three, four, five, the numbers. One, two, three, four, five. So is star three zero 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 one. Well three thousand one, just two zeros. Oh three thousand one, okay. Pound. Pound. Number one, two, three, four, five, then pound star and hit dial. That will take you to a field test. Ah. Then you'll scroll down to uh, PDP, that would be Papa Delta Papa Context Info. Tap on that. The next screen will show five digits, five numbers all lined up, zero, one, two, three, and 4. Usually the first two are the ones that are used. P and no. So it's Papa Delta. I'm a little slow here. I'm writing this down, but I'm also trying to do it on my phone. So it's Papa okay. Delta. Well, go ahead and do the go ahead and do that search. That the numbers star three zero zero one pound one two three four five okay. pound star and call. I'm gonna hold on. I'm gonna do it. I'm I'm here. Give me a second. This is crazy. I, I got my cell phone here. Yep, it says field test. Yeah, it'll say neighborhood measurements, and then below that, connected mode, LTE. Below that, serving cell info. It goes all the way down to the bottom where it says PDP context info. Yep. Tap on that. There'll be a PDP context info zero one two three four. And you tap on the first one, zero. New screen shows up. APN number up above it, and then the IPv4 number below it. <clears throat> you want to write that number down. Correct. First time I did it, the number I wrote down was three zero dot one three zero dot one eight six dot one eight zero. Correct. Okay. Then you want to go to Google. And you want to search something called Network Tools. It's spelled N-E-T-W-O-R-K, Network, dash, tools, plural, T-O-O-L-S dot com. Mm -hmm. And that'll bring up a screen that has a box in it with a bunch of um, different information, express, ping, ping, trace, URL, decode. And it'll have a box. Just below, just above the word go. Yep. Click on that box. Delete those numbers. And input the numbers that are on your phone. And then when you're done, you need to hit that go button on the screen. And um, mine took me to a location where it says that um, that particular IP address belonged to the Department of Defense Network Information Center. And the ones I've done since then take me to uh, look up failed for the number no data in region North America, and now it says in region other. Yeah, that's what that's what mine's actually saying. So, well, let me look up network. Yeah, so that means all my calls, everything I'm doing on my phone is being routed. No data. I got no data as well. Mm. Holy crap. DOD Network Information Center. Yeah, they um <laughs> the pilots in the Air Force or the Marine Corps, they they were fond of saying uh, you don't take flak unless you're over the target. This is whole uh, guys. I am putting this on. This is going on y YouTube as well. This is what I got back from my from my search, and it definitely says Department of Defense Network Information Center. Columbus, Ohio. I have D, uh, original DOD Network Information Center, 3990 East Broad Street, Columbus, Ohio, 43218. I kid you not. I, that is on YouTube. 
I, I just a, posted it on YouTube. Take a picture of that screen because it's the last time you're going to see it. After it's on that, YouTube. Be, uh, I, it, it's unless okay. they take down my YouTube site. I mean, keep it in your picture file. Yeah. Because um, they won't say that in the future. It'll say somewhere in North America. Well, no, no. If if you go if you go up to the top, it says no data. I did a network lookup, mm -hmm. and then I scrolled down. Now that one came back as no data, but then I scrolled down a little bit, and then it has net range, and then it has the DOD. Okay. Yeah, it's the net range, so they own that. Yeah, original tech handle mil dot h s t m s t a r i n. Network DOD. Here's their phone number. <laughs> Let me give you, I'm going to give this out. Here's their phone number. It's 614-692-6337. That's area code 614-692-6337. Their, here, here's their abuse number. So maybe we got to be calling them. 844-347-2457 and their registration name for the for the for the IP or the DNS is 844-347-2457 this is incredible Joseph it is scary but yeah. you know I, I I know that they listen to everything we say anyways but this is it. Yeah. Yeah. So the way, so everybody who is listening within earshot, the way you do this on your phone, type in star three zero zero one pound one, two, three, four, five pound, which is the, the number sign, the, the tic tac toe sign for those star and then hit your dial. Is going to bring up a network, basically a, a, a network system administrator screen. You're going to scroll down to PDP, Papa Delta Papa. You're going to click on that, and then you're going to you're going to see the number zero, and and you're going to hit zero. So what that is, that's a routing. So that's your route table, is what that is. Those one through five numbers that you see, those are your routing tables for your cell phone, and the first route is right to the DOD. Wow. Wow. I just uh, finished seeing Snowden this week, and I recommend it. Yeah. it. The guy was incredibly intelligent. Oh, no, no. He, he isn't. You know, everybody, they, they portray him as a... As a, I watch the, uh, the Netflix uh, interviews with him, and he is... He's operating at a very high level as far as brain power goes. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. He's articulate. He's he's definitely not. Uh, yeah, the guy is is super brilliant. So, but Joseph, man, I thanks for giving me giving our listeners the first bit of information about this weekend, and it does go hand in hand with what I heard and what I've heard. You know, with with the message that I got through my Facebook IM. And everything, but more importantly, thank you for for giving us this piece of information that everybody that's listening can check it out for yourselves. Do it on your on your cell phone. Uh, you probably have black guys in black suits showing up on your doorstep tomorrow, but that's okay. You can ask them when they knock on the door. You can ask them what the you know. Throw your phone at them. How about that? <laughs> throw your phone at them and said since they're listening to it, they can pay the bill. And. That is that is crazy, crazy stuff, and I I didn't even know that. And I'm I'm in the telecom business. I'm not in the cellular, so I don't know how that all works. Well, I know how it works. I just don't know the hacks to it and, and stuff. But uh, and then more more importantly, for those that are listening to us live on YouTube, make sure that you get out there and um, look at those FBI documents that we posted. So, Joseph, is there anything else? Mm, nothing as far as um, danger other than I suspect <laughs> that the two prophecies uh, or, or warnings actually go together. Remember, I, yeah. I mentioned a while back that if we saw boots on the ground, it would uh, it would probably be 
them coming to take uh, take down the cabal, not us. But when they were doing exercises this year, yeah. the military, they were actually practicing combating rogue U.S. military units. Correct. And uh, that was, a, you know, I guess, foreseen, trying to foresee this event coming up. Correct. All right. Um, well, m- well, my friend, we got to get Brooke on here and, uh, and everything, but I do terribly, I, I appreciate it. Thank you very much for sharing this information with us. And, you know, you keep in touch, man, keep, be safe this weekend. Let me, let me know, you know, if anything happens, let's make sure that we stay in touch with each other. And if you need to bug out, you always got a place here in Florida. And, and stuff. <laughs> I don't think I want to bug out to Florida. Yeah, well, we're pretty, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Nah, we're pretty self-contained here. That's why we're in this little community that we're in. Everybody looks out for everybody, which is very important and and everything. So there you go. Okay. Our very special guest who is joining us, Mr. Joseph Reina. 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 I always get that wrong, and I apologize. I'll just call you Joe. How about that? I'll just call you Five Eagles. That'll work. I'll just call you Five Eagles. Our very special guest, Five Eagles. How can you forget that? And and everything. So uh, joining us on the line, giving us a little bit of heads up, a little bit of warning. This is what we're going to do. We're going to take a little little break here because we kind of blew through the, the break. I'm going to take a few minutes, kind of get my head around what I just witnessed, what, what Five Feathers just showed us, which is just it's incredible it it is actually it pisses me off the more i think about it it upsets me that my data is going to the dod but uh guys get out there try it let me know how it turns out for you when we get back we're gonna have brooke agnew on we're gonna be talking about time travel about what he's doing and so you guys don't know a little bit about Brooke. Well, hold on. I'll tell you about Brooke when we get to take this very quick break. Thank you for joining us. You are listening to the Midnight Ocean Radio Show and podcast. You can join us live here every Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. till 2 or 10 p.m. I'm still aggravated with what I just was told. I don't know what I'm more aggravated with. The fact that we're possibly going to have some meteorite issues, uh, that chasmoclysmic, as Five Feathers once said, or the fact that the DOD is listening to my phone calls, which uh, is, is just incredible. But let me get back on track here. So you're listening to the Midnight Ocean radio show and podcast. You can listen to us live every weeknight from 10 p.m. till 2 a.m. Eastern Standard Time or on the web at www.themidnightocean.com. Now, for those that are joining us on YouTube, thank you. For those that are joining us on the radio, if you want to join in the chat, the only chat room that we use is the on YouTube chat. 
If you don't want to go out to YouTube, but you still want to participate, because I always said half the show is what goes on in the chat room, you can always go to our website at www.themidnightocean.com. Scroll down and on the right hand side, you'll see a little chat uh, chat link. You click on that chat link and it will actually link you without actually going to YouTube. We'll link you to the chat so you can watch what is going on there. So without further ado, though, I want to bring in our very special guest, um, Mr. Brooke Agnew. If you guys don't know about Brooke, he actually is a host. He's one of the, I would say he's probably one of the top 10 guests of Coast to Coast AM with George Norrie. But he also has his own show called X Squared Radio, and he's been doing that for, for about 12 years now. So Brooks Agnew uh, grew up in Pasadena, California, hanging around JPL and Caltech. He entered the Air Force in 1973, where he graduated top of his class in electronics engineering. He received a bachelor's in chemistry from Tennessee Technology Technological University with honors. He, he is a multiple patented engineer in energy technology and chemistry. He's a certified quality engineer, a Six Sigma master black belt, and member of the Society of Automotive Engineering. He is also a seven-time Amazon best-selling author and world-renowned lecturer. And Brooke, welcome to the show, and and thank you, my friend. Oh, thanks, Jeff. Thanks for having me on. I, yeah. it's, it's hard to get on your radio program. Your book with so many great people. <laughs> you know, it's amazing. It is amazing. You know, I was reading. This is strange. I'm reading your resume, and I swear to God, I'm talking. I, I, I'm looking at my brothers. <laughs> he he went to University of Tennessee Space Institute. That's where he got his master's degree, all his degrees. Oh, that's cool. At UTSI, and he's a he was a six. Well, he is a six sigma. He worked for Ford for years, and and I'm sitting there reading this, going, "You guys might have uh, the name. The name's the same. His 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 first name is Chris. Uh, you guys might have run across each other." <laughs> but I'm reading this, going, "Holy smokes! This is I, I got my brother on on this show tonight." <laughs> Well, then you know what questions to ask. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, but you you are correct, sir. We we do we have a phenomenal set of guests, which are just we've been we've been very very lucky. It, it's it's funny because I'm reading the who's who kind of uh, of our guests, and and they are definitely the who's who. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you've got one of my best friends, uh, Marine Saint Germain, came on on the fifteenth. Yeah. Uh, you know, these are, these are great names, great teachers. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it, we've been, we have been blessed. You know, my, my aggravation is the fact that we we're still building our audience. Right. And you know that you've been doing this for 12 years. We're still building the audience and I'm like, you know, we'll get there. But the good news is we archive everything. So people will go back and that's what we're finding is that a lot of new listeners are going back and listening to the old shows and, and, and stuff. But, um, uh, yeah. Well, that's what people do. They they go to work and they slip the headphones on and they work on their Excel spreadsheets or their computer programs and they listen to Jeff Norton or Brooks Agnew or whatever. And yeah. So they stay entertained and informed and enlightened all day while they're doing their work. Yeah. Yeah. That's, you know, which is really fun, which is really funny because someone's been beating me up and saying, you got to do a daytime show. And I'm like, eh, you know, people can just download. You, you can still download us. The, yeah, exactly. The only difference between a daytime show and a nighttime show is that you can't call in during the day. Well, I mean, the difference between, and I've always said this, the difference between broadcast radio and webcast radio is that our listeners are sitting there with a laptop and a credit card in their hands. Yeah. Daytime listeners, broadcast listeners, are usually have a steering wheel in their hands. Yeah. No, abs absolutely, absolutely, and it, it it's just uh, you know I know I can get more listeners if I did more of a, bro a daytime, but eh, the, the 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 subject matter that we talk about, no one wants to hear about meteorites hitting hitting the earth <laughs> <laughs> while they're yeah. sitting at work. And, and look what your competition is. I mean, you got uh, four hundred and fifty five yeah. satellite channels you're competing with. Correct. Correct. I mean, that, that, that is true. Hey, did you hear the last segment when we had five feathers on where he did, did you do the cell phone? No, I didn't. I was actually, uh, had a business meeting up till 10 PM. So oh, I wow. darted across the city and made it back to my studio and got lined up for you. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you very much. No. So we, he actually shared with us, uh, a trip. I'll shoot you the email. I'll shoot you an email. You got to try this on your cell phone. And sure enough, 
uh, he basically what he did is showed us how to go into maintenance mode, uh, technician mm-hmm. mode, I should say, and mm-hmm. then look at the at the routing tables of your cell phone. And the first route is right to the on my cell phone was right to the DOD. Oh, really? Yes, yes. Right, well, here you go. Write this down. Here, you got your cell phone with you? Yeah, I got it. It's right now. Here, here you go. Ready? Yeah. Type in star three zero zero one. Type it in like you're dialing it. So it's star in, in the dial pad. So it's mm-hmm. star three zero zero one pound one, two, three, four, five pound star and then hit dial. And that's going to take you to a technician menu. Field test. That's right. So scroll down where you see it will say Papa David Papa PDP something something. Yeah, I see that. So scroll down to that and hit it. Hit hit enter. Yep. And then you're going to see zero. This is your routing table for your phone. So hit okay. zero. Oh, hit the hit the zero. Hit the zero. That's your first route. Okay. On your phone now. It's going to give you an IP address on your network. Right. All right. So here here you go. What is the IP address that it gives you? Well, do I have to press it? Because it's just numbers. Oh, no, no. You just give me the, yeah, give me those numbers. Read those oh, numbers out to me. Uh, I have 10.45.248.229. Please, please don't tell me it's a porn place. I no, 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 it's, it, okay. no. I, I wouldn't embarrass you that one. Okay. I'll, I'll protect you. So it comes know. back as no data, right? But yeah. then when you scroll down, now see on your phone, see your phone comes from that network is actually in California and it doesn't say DOD. Nice. nice. So you're good. Thank you. you. You don't have them breathing on your phone yet. <laughs> well, they wouldn't be able to follow me anyway. Yeah. I'm so scattered when I move around. <laughs> yeah. I can't, I can't follow myself, let alone anybody else follow me. Yeah. But on, on the YouTube channel that, on, on our YouTube channel, I did it, put in the IP address that it gave me, mm. and it came back as DOD. This is what it said. Uh, it said DOD Network Information Center, DNIC, and that it is located in Columbus. I've got 3990 East Broad Street, Columbus, Ohio, 43218. How about that? Well, let's, let's, let's give them something to, uh, to think about. Yeah. Yeah, well, here, let me turn on my phone while they, let me turn on my phone. And, <laughs> you know, it's just so frustrating because, you know, we hear about the government listening. You know, oh, yeah, there was Snowden and, and everything. And, and it's now, what, and, and we just kind of go, yeah, you whatever, not me. But now I'm, I'm pissed because yeah. they're, why are they listening? Well, I know. I mean, I do. So full disclosure for everybody that don't know, during my day job, I do telecommunications work. I don't do cellular. I do, I do hard phone work. Uh, I write software for, for various manufacturers of phone headsets mm-hmm. and, and everything. And we do have government contracts. We, we work for the government. Well, the company's doing it. They, they hire me to write the code. So, it, you know, so I can understand in some regard because I did sign up. I asked you with the Air Force, yeah, you know, you're you, there's Snowden Jr. Yeah, that's right. We, I signed up. Well, I, I kicked myself out. That's a, that's another story. Maybe when you have me on your show one day, I'll, I'll tell my story on how I got kicked out of Homeland Security uh, as a defense. I was a defense contractor working for a company that had a contract with Homeland Security, and I, I hated it. Well, I'll tell you right now, I hated it so bad. I went across, got drunk at the embassy and or got drunk at the pub right across the street from the Chinese embassy, mm-hmm. walked up to the cameras at the Chinese embassy and flipped them off. And then of course their security comes out. And the next day I was, I was gamefully that, unemployed. That will do it. Yeah. I was unemployed. Well, I, yeah, I wanted to get, well, I didn't want, I, I realized what I was doing was not for the betterment of man in which I was sold the story. So, yeah. So I lost all my, all my clearance, everything, but it's okay. I don't care. I'm not going to lose sleep. Well, I didn't lose sleep over. I actually, I can sleep a lot better now at night knowing that. So 
But uh, yeah, let's uh, let's give the boys uh, a little topic to to think about and to hone in on. Um, you are known not only for your radio show and on coast to coast. It doesn't take you very long. It was funny because when I got your name, I was like, oh, and then I, I I put you in the system, and I was like, holy, I'm talking. To, <laughs> I'm t- I now I know who I'm talking to, Mister Time Travel <laughs> from coast to coast. So. Yeah, let's uh, let's give them something to talk about. You know, the listening on as they as they all lean forward in their in their as they have their headphones on. Well, it's just interesting. You know, when I when I was doing the research for the latest trilogy that I'm I'm writing now, I'm finishing up the last of the three books. The first two have, have already been published, but it's kind of a a Tom Clancy style uh, book that uh, uses fictional characters in true situations. And as I started to write the book, I really got into the intrigue of how presidencies are bought and sold. And I, I discovered in the research of it how we have another government operating inside our elected government. I call it the agency government, but it's, um, it is not an elected government. It, it runs everything. It taxes us, fines us, writes laws. Uh, and we have no representation in that government. It's completely tyrannical. It's a pure definition of tyranny. Yeah. And uh, it has hundreds and hundreds of thousands of highly paid people that work in that government, and 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 nobody controls them. And as I watch uh, Congress. Uh, totally frustrate themselves as they haul in these agencies one after the other and and order them to give congress documents to tell them what they're doing why are they doing it Mm -hmm. the agencies just thumb their nose at them and say we're not going to give you the documents in fact uh mr congressman when i leave here I'm going back to my office and i'm going to shred everything (laughs) and there's nothing you can do about it right because you know what? When you ask me questions about it, I'm going to say, I don't remember. Uh, yeah. 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 I, I, it is. Oh, and by the way, I would be, I'd add one more. Oh, and thank you for giving me the list of the documents that you're honing in on. So I kind of understand where you're going with your and investigation. That saves me a little bit of time, right? Otherwise, I was just going to shred the whole building. Yeah. Right now, yeah. I'm just going to shred the stuff that you want. That'll save me some time. Yeah. And yeah. And yeah, I can shred this instead of fly planes into the building. <laughs> that's yeah, sad we but, probably I mean, shouldn't be saying that that is a, that's a crass joke to say so close to 9-11 but you know people that are in the know know that you know the, a lot of it, i think 9-11 was well besides the tragic events the human life that was lost and everything but it was about destroying evidence well i mean i had richard gabe on my program and he's the head of the uh, american institute of architects yeah they have 2600 architectural scientists that reviewed all the evidence from 9-11 and they concluded irrefutably that it was a controlled explosive that brought down at least building seven maybe the other two as well and that's just crazy that's how in the world could that be but it is there's the facts don't lie yeah yeah and you know in the hit well i got in trouble for posts i got i got called out once because the other day when spacex blew up me you know, on on the platform mm-hmm. the, 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 and the first thing i said is look at all that still there and all that rocket fuel and and you know rocket fuel is more combustionable than jetliner flu you know why isn't the tower falling over yeah yeah you know why didn't why didn't the structure of the of the rocket tower burn melt and fall over it, it's just look it it, it you know, I know there's a lot of theories all the way to the fact that, you know, the, it was all CGI, right? It never happened. I, I, I definitely don't believe it's CGI, but I, I do know that there was opportunists out there in the government that took an op, a good opportunity and, and, uh, and milked it for what they could. Well, it, it, it got me. I was in the aviation business. I owned an airline mm-hmm. and uh, we were doing some background checks. In fact, the FBI was on their way to my office that day on September mm-hmm. 11th. And the FBI agent called me from, uh, from Greenville, Tennessee about, uh, oh, it was just about straight up nine o'clock. Yeah. And, uh, he said, I guess you know, I'm not coming. I said, why? He said, turn your TV on. 
So I turned the TV on and the first tower was, was burning and the second one got hit while we were on the phone. Yeah. And I said, yeah, I, I, I can see what's going on. That was the end of my airline, Jeff. I'm telling you, I, I lost everything. Oh. I had a, I had enough money in the bank to make payroll and insurance payments for the rest of my uh, staff until I got them jobs somewhere else. And then I closed the doors. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I had same or similar, uh, experience. We were, we were doing software for banking, uh, for, for the banking industry. And we had some major banks, some huge banks. And this was, we were all, you know, toasting champagne a couple of weeks earlier and thinking that finally all these years of hard work was going to pay off. And then September 11th, I lost four customers. Well, let me ask you a question about that. I've done mm-hmm. uh, software for banks on the HR side. Mm-hmm. Um, how does a bank like HSBC or Wells Fargo create tens of thousands of phony accounts and run money into those accounts when you have to have a driver's license. You have to have, sometimes you have to have a birth certificate to open a bank account. How do they do that? Well, the accounts are already open. So what they do is that they'll split the account. So a lot of people will, you know, when you get a checking account, you get a savings account or you get a money market account at the same time. So they've mm-hmm. already proven, they already have the people's documents. What they will do is they'll open two accounts at the same time and then they fund them. So they'll take, you know, if you deposit a hundred dollars and the way that Wells Fargo system was set up on the online part of it is, is that you had to join account. So even though you had two accounts, when you go to look at your assets, it would, so if you gave them a hundred dollars, so they would put a hundred in your, they put $95 in your checking and $5 in your savings that they created for you. Well, I mean, do they ever make a mistake? Oh, they did. And send, and send you uh, the bank record, you know, like you well, get your monthly statement. You know what? And, and you see that $80,000 flowed through your savings account in and out. Well, no, you, you never know. saw that. That was the thing is that they wouldn't, because the way that their system was set up is that you didn't see a, a breakout of checking and, and, or, and savings. You just saw total bank assets. Um, but we know the reason that they do it is so yeah. that they can funnel illegal money into the bank, launder it, and then send it back out well, of the bank clean. Yeah, well, that that's the way. That's the reason why the bank allowed it to happen, right? But the now, but they're telling the the masses out there that these people were doing it because they were getting bonuses for for the amount of accounts that they were opening up. I'm and not believing that. I, I, don't, far, I don't fired a bunch of people, but HSBC, yeah. all those people are still working there. Yeah, well, HS, HSBC just settled a, uh, a, a, a multi million, like a three, four hundred million dollar lawsuit with the Fed because they were laundering, they got caught laundering money. Yeah. But yeah. that, I mean, the one I'm talking about is when they got caught uh, with $2.2 billion of drug cartel yeah. money laundered yeah. through over 10,000 phony accounts. And the whole dossier, which was about a thousand pages long, yeah. was turned into the district attorney of Suffolk County, New York, who just happened to be Miss Steppenfetch. Mm-hmm. I mean, Loretta Lynch. And um, later she becomes attorney general. And the guy that was the board member of HSBC when the $2.2 <laughs> billion dollars was laundered yeah. was James Comey. Was Comey. Yeah, I know. It, it's all, look, they're all inside. How do you think they, they fund a lot of these? You know, before, you know, in Oliver North, in, in order, you know, back in the day, in order to fund a lot of their operations, they would, they would sell arms or they would sell, you know, drugs. And, and now they realize that all they have to do is go in and, and, uh, manipulate the banking system. And, wow. and it's a lot easier that, you know, th- that way you don't get hauled up in front of Congress. You as a politician or you as a general or a spook don't get hauled up in front of Congress asking why you're selling, you know, physical assets to, 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 uh, dictators of third world countries. Now you, you, now you just pull the CEOs of the banks up there and, and make them fall on the sword for you. Well, and, and you get your, uh, your lobbyists around town to carry yeah. little mineral envelopes. Yeah. Around to different uh, oh. congressmen. I, I, you look, I, I know how it works. There's a little island. If you ever get over here in Florida, there's a little island I spent a lot of time on called Fisher. And, and back in the day. And I, I don't care. I mean, I hope the FBI comes in and interviews me because I can, <laughs> uh, there's, there's about 20 congressmen that I can, I can put on the burner right now. A couple governors, a president. So, I mean, uh, yeah, I don't care. I mean, I, I was definitely a, an insider. 
at one point. And I just, I, I, I woke up one day and, and needed to take a bath and ask for forgiveness and said, I will never do that again. But, uh, yeah, I, a lot of people are like, you shouldn't be talking about that. You'll get the, other. it's like, yeah, show up. Yeah. But of course, you know, I'm the one that's going to fall on, you know, they're going to make me fall on my sword, but yeah, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to go out kicking and I'll, I'll go out kicking and screaming. <laughs> you guys, you guys get all that out there. Yeah. That's right. More that's time right. right. Yeah. You guys, yeah. Write that down. <laughs> I'll, I'll have them knocking on the door tomorrow. It's funny when I, I, well, when I was doing my political pot, you know, this show, here I got clear. <laughs> my my attorney, my my good friend, who's an attorney, is now shaking his head. Well, he doesn't listen to the show that much. He thinks where it's all tinfoil stuff. But when I was doing my political podcast, he goes, "You're just looking to go to jail, aren't you?" And it was like, "Why?" And he says, "You can't say that stuff, Harry." <laughs> he goes, "Especially with what you do." He goes, "You're you're they're going to get you." And uh, so then when I started this one up, I said, "Well, I'm going to talk about paranormal stuff." And he's like, "Well, that they don't care about that." Yeah, I but, don't care about that. I, well, but I don't know though. They they got my they got my phone routing to their database, to their DOD database. Oh, That's crazy. true. Crazy. I, I don't you know, I I I probably shouldn't be looking for that pressure cooker. <laughs> don't use that word. Pressure cookers are a bad word now. They, yeah. Um Well you know was- how many people did well I wanna did you, you know, last time when the in Boston bombing, how many people got actually hooked up because they were Googling pressure? Naturally, when the, when the news comes out and says they're going to use a pressure cooker bomb, people are going to Google it and see how to do it. And the government was surprised. And they there was a lot of people that got knocks on the doors within a few weeks. Well, that's a, that's a, a whole other method uh, warfare has Warfare has changed because yeah. because the weapons are so bad now that uh, it could you know kill every living thing on the earth. Yeah. And besides, the guys down at Wars R Us, they make a lot of money in war, but they realized now if they play, it could get very serious. Yeah. So all they really care about now is battle. Yeah. So from 1945 until now, all we've had are battles, no wars. Yeah. We just fight all the time. Conflict. Yeah. Ongoing conflict. Yeah. I'm amazed at the size of the U.S. defense budget. And then I have to slap myself in the forehead and say, defense against whom? Yeah. You know, we, yeah. ha- we spend more than the next eight countries combined. And, and all those countries plus ours is about 90% of the defense budget for the whole world. So who are we defending against? Yeah. I don't get it. I think yeah. we're just we're just spending money for weapons. I did a drone wars update uh, this last Sunday. It just blows my mind. This whole high tech warfare industry that has it's like uh, it's like the superstore of mm-hmm. of high tech toys and gadgets. And DARPA is just pumping money into every university. Uh, you know, I make oh. I make electric vehicles, and the rage now. And I have a lot of people who are looking for to invest in vehicles that can self-drive. And I, I asked the investors, why are you investing in self-driving cars? And they said, because the government is writing enormous grants yep. for these country uh, companies to develop self-driving cars. I said, yeah, but no one's going to buy them. I don't want one. There's two generations away that won't buy self-driving cars. We like driving our own cars. Mm-hmm. You know what's pushing it, Jeff? It's it's robotics. Yeah. Artificial intelligence robotics. They're trying to make self-driving robots. Correct. To fight war. Correct. And they're getting the car companies and the universities to develop the technology. Yeah. Yep, Starnet. I mean, there. It, it, no, it, it's obvious. Skynet. 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 Yeah. You know, it, it, it is obvious. I mean, it's, you know, like I said, in the former day, writing a lot of the predictive analysis software that we were writing and, and everything, it, it's all based, you know, we thought we were writing it for medical, for the medical industry to help sure. fight disease and stuff. Mm-hmm. And it, it had nothing to do with, with that. It had everything to do with, if I take a satellite image, you know, how does the satellite know? Because I, I actually saw these when I was at the Java High Performance Lab writing software. 
working on on you know look, we thought we were looking at uh, modal X-rays, and and then from the X-rays determining breast cancer, that was the big push, and having computers you know cycle through a digital X-ray and say yes, breast cancer, no. And, and do that. Well, then we come to find out they should, they were showing a satellite imagery, geospatial work. And, and I'm looking at it and I'm like, well, wait a minute, that's a tank. <laughs> Those are troops. <laughs> you know, what is this all about? And, and it was friend, it was a basically friend or foe trying to teach drones to determine if you're a friend or foe. And wow. Then, yeah. This is back in the, uh, early 2000, 2005, 2006. It's come a long way since then. Oh, it's not. It, it is. It's incredible what's out there. But I still, you know, when I when I pull up my patents, I, I've got patents and stuff. I, I'll see all of the sub sub patents that are off mine, off my data modeling patents and stuff. It, it, and and you, you almost all of them go back. You know, they're all signed by people because patents have to be issued to people. And uh, and then you go and look for the, where these people work for, and you're, you'll see a lot of DARPA. A lot of well, you'll see a lot of university research. Yeah, tied to that, that's how I I discovered it by accident because mm -hmm. I was reading a paper where they uh, a university was uh, receiving accolades in some of the professional uh, press uh, peer review stuff yeah. about viral research for. Uh, fighting cancer mm -hmm. because I mean, a lot of your listeners don't know, but some of mine knew uh, I had cancer last year mm -hmm. and uh, some of the new technology, cause we're here in the Carolina's health system. They're the epicenter of all this research. And they said, listen, we have a new, a new treatment. We don't do it the way we used to do it. Now we just teach your T cells how to do this. And I thought it was pretty cool. So I enrolled myself in the experimental program, got cured and so I got interested in the papers and I was reading it. And the interesting thing was that they were using uh, viral macrophages to uh, teach T cells how to go after certain proteins mm -hmm. in cancer cells to prevent the cancer cells from dividing. It's really quite clever. Yep. But then I wanted to know where did they get the money to do that research? Well, it came from this foundation, uh, some something like, I don't know what the name of the foundation was, but it was really innocuous sounding. So I looked up that foundation and I said, well, where did they get their money? It came from DARPA. And it even gave the budget that it came from in DARPA and darn if they didn't have the link to that budget on their website. So I followed it. Oh my gosh. It was, I was afraid to have it on my computer. That's how amazing this treasure trove of information yeah. of DARPA was. They were spending money everywhere, but it wasn't for cancer research. It was for weapons research. Yeah, delivery. Yeah, delivery. Yep. Uh, I, I don't doubt it at all. I mean, well, I, I can tell you this. I mean, I, 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 shoot, I'll tell you. I worked for, I put it right on the air. I worked for a defense contractor called uh, Pangea out of Chicago. And it was through a health initiative is that we wrote a program. Uh, wrote, I wrote the interfaces. There was two projects that I wrote for Pangea. One was the, uh, uh, we worked with the biological unit for the National Guard. You know, the guys that go out in the containment suits. We, mm -hmm, we designed mm -hmm. their, we, it was it was pretty cool. I, I love doing it. We did it all in Flash, which is a, a really graphical language in a sense. But those wall boards that you see on TV, on the shows where people are moving with their hands and everything, mm -hmm. we built a similar system. It was the Critical Incident Sims, what it was called Sims, C-I-M-S. Uh, it was the Critical Incident Management System. And that was actually funded through DARPA, through the county hospital system in Chicago. Now, how does th this is this is so the listeners out there will know, uh, you know, so you have a hospital who gets a grant to build a critical incident management system for the fifth CST, which is the National Guard there in Illinois on the biological uh, assessment and response team. So it, it all went through this hospital. Then it went from the hospital down to, well, went to Pangea, and then Pangea, we wrote the software for the 5th CST. So if you were an investigator and you were looking, you wouldn't think anything of it because it's, it's hospital grant money. But no, yeah. they funneled it through the hospital to get it down for building out this critical the system. So I built that 
for for the fifth CST, and then and then from there they came back and said, "Look, we want you to build a um, a system. We want to look at diseases." And basically, what happens is when a person presents themselves to the hospital, uh, what will happen is if they put in a modality uh, or, or a symptomology, they put in the, the doctor puts in the symptomology. Then what will happen is if it was like an anthrax or if it was some kind of viral infection or even nuclear and everything, it would alert the fifth CST <laughs> that it was doing. So I was like, okay. I mean, because a lot of people were, you know, we had bird flu. You had a lot of, a lot of viral that doctors don't necessarily, you know, everybody thinks doctors know everything. But when you hang out with them long enough, you'll realize all doctors really know. There's doctors that do know a lot. But most of them know how to how to read this thing called the Merck Manual. <laughs> and they look up. There's a little red book that most emergency room doctors carry around with them, and it basically has symptomology. And then they go and they go, oh, okay, okay, and it tells them what to do, right? I mean, it's basically a book. And so we were taking that Merck Manual for biologicals and nuclear and, and everything, and we, we kind of combined it. Well, that was the so it was volunteer kind of thing where the ER they would they would log into this into the system uh, that was called Guardian, great name, right? Guardian. Mm-hmm, we're gonna mm-hmm. we're gonna the mother country's gonna love you, and you're gonna put that in. You know, the doctor's gonna key in your symptomology if you if you don't know what it is. If you know if it's a broken arm, then obviously you're a broken arm. And so we worked on that project and it was great. And then one of the problems though that we had was the vast amount, we were doing over 300 million uh, data points a second in calculations. And I'm looking in the database and I'm like, why are we doing this? This is like a a pilot program where you're only supposed to have maybe 100 to 200 patients a day. Why are we doing this? And then lo and behold, what I found out is that another group unbeknownst to me, uh, took the voluntary system where the, where the doctors were typing the information into this, into the system, this government database. Well, this other group actually hooked it right into the EMR, the electronic medical record system. So now every patient that ever presents in these hospitals, their, their, their information was going through the system. And that's where I had a problem. I think that that's fine as long as it's John Doe. I mean, as long as oh no no oh no, I could look up. I could go in the database and I can tell you who the person was. We were seeing uh, we were seeing lab results for AIDS patients or people. This database, no, no. The government. Let me explain something to you how the government works. The government doesn't care about concealing your identity. They they can care less. They're they're not like a a business who has to worry about. your information being given well, to F- a third the party. The FBI has been doing a hell of a job of covering up personal information. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> but, but no, they don't. They don't. They don't employ the government. Doesn't have to employ the same security policies that that you, that a corporation or a business does. Oh, that's true. That's true. They they don't. It, it's uh, it. When I went and complained, this is what I. This is what happened. I went and you know naturally I had a very hard issue with this. And I just said, look, I, I can't do this. And the guys that were running, it were all great guys, all really nice guys. I mean, they, but they, they, you know, they had a business to run and I, and I get it. And, and I told them I had a hard time with it. So they were like, well, why don't you take some time off? Uh, and no, that'll fix everything. Yeah. Why don't you take some time off and think about, and I just said, look, I can't do it. And it got to the point to where my work suffered because I just couldn't do it. I, I couldn't, you know, I'm sitting there at my at my keyboard going, I'm writing software that is like against everything I stand for. It, it's, like, I, it's like writing software that flips votes at the voting yeah, machine. Yeah. Well, it, this it, is it medical can, history. Yeah, You're, uh, you know, I think your private history, your private information ought to be private. And yeah, you know, you, and I'm like here. I just had a hard time with it, and and like I said, I went. <laughs> I'm like, I got to get out of this business, and I don't want anything to do with it. And I got to figure out a way of getting fired. <laughs> so I I did. I went across. I went, walked down the street. I was in Chicago, and there's the embassy there. There's a nice little pub right at the right at the Kennedy. Nice little Irish pub. Right at the corner, I got I got heavily intoxicated. Walked right up to the security cameras in the Chinese embassy, flipped them off. Had Chinese guards come out, 
created an incident. And the next thing I know, I was pulled in. When I showed up to work, I was told that I, I was no longer needed. And the bad part is you weren't the first one to do that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you asked me about time travel. Yeah, that. yeah. Let's. Um, I, I wrote a book called Remembering the Future, The Physics of the Soul and Time Travel. And I think it was kind of a intentional shotgun blast out there to see how many different genres I could hit with one title. It was designed to be a self-help book to pick up where the book, The Secret, left off. Because I right. thought there was something remarkable there. Everybody saw, you know, what the bleep do we know? And uh, they realized that there was, that Ron DeBurn had hit on something, that there was something about this law of attraction. But the book fell, you know, woefully short of making anything happen. What people did is they ran out, bought their favorite magazines, cut the pages out, stuck them to their refrigerator, turn their refrigerator door into an intention machine and then a remarkable thing happened nothing nothing so occasionally people would end up with the thing that they wished for but it's much more powerful than just getting things much more powerful so i started doing my own research to see what are the, what's the real mechanism behind all the chaos that's in the universe and what makes up what we see as the third dimension? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we physicists believe very little. We, we go off facts. We go off relationships. We try to build, uh, elegant uh, thought experiments and, and, and then try to disprove them. Uh, but one of the things that we agree on is that the universe is full of all kinds of energy we just can't see it mm -hmm. we call it dark energy because we can't see it it could be very super bright energy for all we know and the point is that it it's in chaos and how we know this is when we look at the results of cern and other colliders where we pump up these hydrogen protons and accelerate them to enormous speeds which increases their mass hugely like from one electron volt to 14 tera electron volts yeah. and then we smash them into each other like a figure eight race and when the protons come apart we we can catalog the frequencies that that make up that proton and it's becoming a pretty repeatable and reliable menu of frequencies and we call them quarks or colors or uh you know different kinds of subatomic particles sub subprotonic particles but for all of that we can't take the menu of subprotonic particles and make a proton we just haven't figured out how to do it yet yeah. but the universe does it stars spit out oxygen they spit out silicone uh, you know silicon they spit out nitrogen like like factories into the universe they take this energy and can somehow make it and here's the key word resonate so that it can form a proton. And once that proton's formed, it's pretty much there forever, unless we split it apart. But one proton is hydrogen, and then helium, and then, you know, so on and so forth through the periodic table. We know how they work. We know how much they weigh. We know what their properties are, but we don't know how to make one. Uh -huh. So what is the principle that allows this chaotic energy to come together without intelligence so to speak to become matter and that is really the law of attraction so the the idea was to figure out what's the mathematical process for this to occur and can i make it simple and elegant enough that i don't drive all the readers away which my publisher said you know every time you put a formula in your book you're going to cut your readership in half and uh he wasn't right. He wasn't right. I put some formulas in there and the book did just fine because I tried to make him elegant enough instead of, instead of following page after page of mathematics. Everybody remembers the equation E is equal to MC squared. It, it actually looks simple, but the process for deriving that equation took years off Einstein's life. What we see is a relationship between energy, mass, and the speed of light the speed of light being sort of a speed limit of the universe uh -huh. 
In other words, it's it's asymptotic. It's an asymptote. You can't go any faster. You can approach it, but you can't go any faster. Just like reaching infinity. You can get close, but you can't get there. And the idea is that as the faster energy goes in the universe, the larger its mass becomes until until it reaches infinity. But the real way to look at it is that distance in the universe becomes zero. Everything becomes local. And that's how the law of attraction really works. So how do we take numbers and get to this point where everything becomes now, everything becomes local, everything becomes something we can perceive and we can observe directly and by observing it, affect it. The, the key was in uh, a mathematician whose name was Fibonacci. He discovered a natural progression in numbers that occurs in nature, not just in biology, but in molecular biology. And um, everyone pretty much knows what the Fibonacci sequence is. You take the two previous numbers, add them together to get a third number. Then you take the second and third to get the fourth and, yep. and so on and so forth. It's the way bacteria divides. It's the way... Uh, cellulose is built the way the periodic chamber lays out the way planets arrange themselves around stars it's it is a natural order of things why is that why does this process work the way that it does that answer is what unlocked the secret the answer is once you perform the fibonacci sequence for eight iterations in other words for eight steps when you divide the seventh number into the eighth number, you get the golden mean. You get 1.618 to 1. You get phi. That golden mean, that golden ratio, is the ratio by which energy has to come together in order to make those protons. So if we can do that consciously, with our own consciousness, with our own repeated energy put into a future equation we can make that equation manifest the answer. And that's how the book works. That's how the process works. And the rest of the book is just explaining how to do that, how to listen, how to pour energy into your idea in the future, or for that matter, the past, and make that uh, dream that you've had manifest. Gotcha. And, you know, and that, and that is a... Physic, it, how do I say this? People think of, you know, when they think of Time Machine, they think of the movie H.G. Wells, right? The classic Time Machine going back in the past. But I, I think that your your explanation and the way that you do it, that is that is the correct. Well, I, actually, I, they're one and the same. Because you'll if you look at H.G. Wells' machine, the yeah. machine never moved. The machine stayed in the same place, whether it was in the past or the future or in his conservatory. It was in the same spot. What he did is he collapsed time around it and then, and then slowed time down again. And he was in a different, oh. in a different time. The machine didn't go through space at the speed of light. What he was able to do is magnetically crunch time to where everything became local. Gotcha. Okay. I remember when he had to go back to the conservatory and had to push the time machine forward like 30 feet? Yeah. And then go back into the future so he'd be on the other side of that wall? Other side, yeah. Yeah. Got, okay. So he was he was like the, the center point, and then everything else revolved around, basically revolved around his, his point. Yeah. And then he was he able. Was doing, he was crushing time uh -huh. to his spot. And then re-expanding it. Now, if you think of time in from the perspective of, say, a photon that leaves the star Arcturus and goes zipping across space for more than six light years and reaches your eye standing here on Earth, and you say, oh, wow, there's Arcturus. Yeah. Yeah. From the photon's point of view, there's no distance between Arcturus and Earth because it's traveling at the speed of light. At the speed of light, all distance disappears. But the time is there. So, oh, I yeah, I mean, like, if, yeah, I'm thinking about it. If I'm, I'm kind of envisioning, 
if I was on a tennis ball, right? If I was sitting on a tennis ball mm-hmm. and I was hit from one racket to the other, to me, I'm on that tennis ball. That's all I know. Is is my my position on the ball? I don't I don't know that I'm hurtling through space or or anything. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for all we know, Earth is standing still, and the rest of the universe is revolving around us. Gotcha. That makes yeah. Okay, I get it. I'm I'm trying to conceptually put it in my head. The, 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 the process. The thing to understand here is that the tennis ball hit from racket to racket you have a concept that there's a pathway for that ball between the two rackets. Yeah. But at the speed of light, there is no pathway. The ball is instantly from this racket to that racket. There is no distance in between. When the pitcher releases the baseball, it instantly appears in the catcher's glove. There's no pathway. There's no way if a proton can survive for six light years across, you know, gazillions of particles of gas out there, charged particles and whatnot outside our our, our heliosphere yeah. to reach Earth. Okay, I I, I get it. I, I I'm I'm coming on board with you. So once you once you figure that everything is local, including time, then you could we're probably the only beings on this planet that can actually do this because of the spirit that's inside of us. Mm-hmm. We can put our dream very clearly out there in the future. And the more detail we can add to it, the better. It's like ringing a bell out there in the future. It makes a sound and the sound goes out all over the past, which is your present now. The idea is to come back to the present and look for the things that are resonating with the sound of that bell. Because if you hold on to that bell out there in the future, it's just going to go dead. Nothing is going to happen. That's what people were doing when they put the picture on the refrigerator door. They were continuously going out to the future and smacking the heck out of that bell. Yeah. But then they were doing nothing. But they weren't, they weren't following its, its, its resonance. Right. Because there are things back here in the past that are resonating with the manifestation of that bell that you have to put energy into or that bell is never going to appear. I get it. See, that was one thing I never, you know, I, I, I always believe that you know, we can make our own destiny. I mean, don't, you know, be it through the, I always tell my kids, my daughters, you know, the only thing you can really choose in life are your friends and your education. Those are really the only two things that you you really have a choice over in in your life. Everything else yeah. is kind of you know hit or miss. But you can and choose. In respect to that, you kind of get out what you put in. It, well, exactly, and and well, that's the thing. Is you, now once you've chosen one or the other, or chosen both, you know, in that case, you you have to put in you know x amount, and and those are but those are the only two things that you can choose. So so the problem that I had with the secret is the fact that. I can, I can envision myself, you know, sitting on a yacht, say five years from now or what, you know, whatever the, the thing is, is then how do I get there? Well, I, in, in my case, it would have to be through education because my parents, my family's not wealthy and I don't know if I have a rich, rich uncle anyways. And if I did, I have about 20 cousins in line in front of me. So so that ain't gonna happen. So I'll have to do it through through my education. So I I always that's where it short circuited, where the secret short circuited for me was was that. But now I get it. Now what is is that you're saying you put that beacon? I'm thinking of a sailor. So you put that beacon out there, and then you have to now. It's our goal or our job now to kind of search out that beacon through you know through time so with that brooke we got music going on which we have to take a hard break and okay. uh, and everything so we'll, we'll take a four minute break we're going to come back and you can tell me if my thought process is correct or if i'm completely if i need to go back to school <laughs> so all right all right so we're talking with brooke agnew here at the midnight ocean radio show and podcast join us live every monday through friday from 10 p.m till 2 a.m Eastern Standard Time or on the web at www.themidnightocean.com. This 
is the Midnight Ocean with Jeff Norton on the Paranormal State Radio Network. This is the Midnight Ocean Radio Show and Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Norton. Join us here every Monday through Friday from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. Eastern Standard Time or on the web at www.themidnightocean.com. If you're joining us for the first time on YouTube, we ask that you hit that ever most important subscribe button. That is very important to us. 
And if you are a social media person and you happen to have a Facebook account, go ahead and join us over at the Midnight Ocean. All you have to do is type in the Midnight Ocean in the search bar. It'll take you right to us. And of course, follow us on Twitter. You can also hashtag me directly. I do respond if you go TMO guest or TMO host. I, I actually watch both of those, but our guests also will look at that if you have a question for a guest on a particular night. So without further ado, we were right before we went off the break, we were talking with our very special guest, Brooke Agnew. And I just want to say that I think I think I get it, Brooke. I, I, I do. I think I get it. I hope I get it <laughs> from your explanation that you that you gave. Well, the, the thing to remember is that when you put an idea out there in the future, mm -hmm. you you got to put it out there as clearly as possible. The color, the size, the cost, uh, as many of the parts of that idea as you can. Sure. It's going to fall into one of three categories. It's going to call fall into the category of having, like I want a house or a motorcycle or a a, a, a fancy car or something like that. Or it's going to fall into the category of doing, like I want to, uh, there are things I want to do or being, I want to be a talk radio host. I want to be a professor. I want to yeah. be a great lecturer. I want to travel the world. You know, these are things that you can put out there in the future. Now, I highly recommend the latter two. I think having is the great trick of mortality. And many of us can get lost and very depressed because these principles that I'm trying to explain to you will work for having. They will make you rich, but that wealth is not going to make you happy. I have a lot of friends that have a lot of money. They have a lot of stuff and they're miserable. Yeah. They're, they're drinking and they're doing other things to try to inebriate yep. or anesthetize that pain. But uh, because they've wasted a lot of their life after going after things mm -hmm. and that's not where it's at you need to you'll figure that out sooner or later but yeah. i would rather you figure it out sooner no I, I i i i get it because you know me being a software guy i mean i guess that we need to step back and stop looking at everything at a at a macro and kind of look at a micro level because me being a software guy all my years that i've been in this business i never questioned uh, my success in, in the business. And th that's probably because I put that out there. I, I knew at a very young age what I wanted to do in the software. I wanted to be a software guy. And I put that out there. And lo and behold, I am a software developer and pretty pretty prolific. I mean, I've got a lot of kudos in it and uh, a lot of, lot of different accolades from different employers and contracts. And now I get it because that message was very clear. I I knew exactly what I wanted to do, software wise. You're, pretty, you're a pretty twisted guy, Jeff. Why is that? Software. I mean, software. You got to be like demented. I think. <laughs> <laughs> I. You know what I. Do you, you know what I love about writing software is is the is the challenge. It, it's the algorithm part of it. I've always said if you can put it on a board, I'll create it. And the fun part is putting it on the board. And, and yeah, the, yeah, the yeah, yeah. you know, working through the algorithm was one, the, one of the things that we do in the automotive industry. We do a lot of things repetitively uh -huh. and uh, that drives us to yeah. robotics. Yeah. And sometimes we have these big, nice indexing machines that we really like uh -huh. and they've been paid for for a long time and they do the, they do the job for us. And we don't want to spend a couple million dollars to build another one because we know it's not going to do as good a job as this old indexing machine, which yeah. is a big steel turntable with like 12 different operations on it, a sure. punch press and a drill and a welder oh, yeah. and all this stuff on it. And so sooner or later, one decade or another, the control panel gives out. The relays that used to run it just don't work anymore. And if you've ever tried to troubleshoot these things with all oh. relay logic and wires and fuses, and it just becomes a nightmare. So what we used to do is pull the control panel off and throw it away. Yeah. So now we have all this input output that's not connected to anything, but we do have the blueprints. 
And what I used to like to do was sit down with just the blueprints of the indexing machine, knowing how it's working, looking at the prints and being able to figure out how the index machine works, and then writing a ladder logic program with a slick 500 Mm -hmm. to, to run that indexing machine. Yeah. That was cool. See, I, I I get it. I, yeah, I mean, that's, I kind of, well, I mean, tonight I'll tell you, I did the same thing. I, there's a lot of, you're in the radio, you're in your studio. So what kind of equipment are you using? Are you? I have a, I have a Mackie mixer and I'm okay. powering with a Toshiba laptop. And Okay. So you're not, you're not running Telos or anything like that or an OptiMod or. No. Okay. Yeah. Cause you see, I'm poor too. I, I, well, I'm poor <laughs> in the sense that when, when I started this Sandy, my, my business partner in life and also my business partner, uh, she was like, no, you're not going out and spending $10,000 on an OptiMod. <laughs> so, so, so I looked at what those things do and then I just built my own. And tonight actually is the first official night that we are running off my own software driven audio processor. It sounds great. Does it? I, oh. I'm, I'm so impressed with the, the technology of your board. We call it the board in the business thing. Yeah. How the commercials come in and the background music and the guy that announces and all the timing and clock yeah. and everything. It's really, really good on, oh, on your program. I like it. I like the sound. See, I wrote that. I mean, that's all software that I've, that I've written. I mean, well, I, I want to, I want to back up the, uh, the clock itself is I wrote the clock. There's a, uh, a product, uh, called Sam that does the, uh, that actually functions and does you know, actually executes the clock. It's kind of like the JVM, the job, the virtual machine. So, but yeah, but no, tonight is the first night with my processors that, uh, because I wanted to get that big FM sound, uh, you know, that big booming sound that okay. one, you know, the, what is it? The, uh, uh, Y 11, because it's louder than 10, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I wanted to do that. And so, yeah, tonight is the first the night. Days, uh, of coast to coast. They had a guy named, uh, I think his name was Sam McDonald. Anyway, he had one of these voices that really didn't sound human. Yeah. He was the guy that used to say, if you're calling west of the Rockies, yeah. you know, yeah. it, was, it was incredibly deep. And he's a real guy because I, I oh, met him. He's, he works, he works at uh, a radio station in Las Vegas. He does the morning, he does the morning news and uh, morning show in, in a station in Las Vegas. Unbelievable voice. Yeah. yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. I hunted him down. I, I, I literally hunted him down. I found out and he was working at, he's, he, he is still working. He does the morning drive at a station in Las Vegas. Cause I wanted him to do our promos it's and, amazing. and he couldn't, he, he was because of what he, he, he at this time art came back. So he was doing arts work. Uh, I reached out to John B and said, Hey, look, John B was doing John B stuff. So finally I just, I, I surfed the internet and found a guy. <laughs> said, that, that is another great voice. It's yeah. just one of those voices. You, there are only a few voices like it in the world. And yeah. those, those two, does he still have the, the gray flat top? He's, he's about six foot 17. He's yeah. a great guy. Yeah. I, I didn't meet him. I just, like I said, I, I Googled him and, and, uh, well, I, how, how did I find them? I found, you know what it was? I found an MP3 clip that had him, <laughs> and inside the MP3 header in the metadata was his name. How about that? That's how I found, I, I went and I found some, some promo clips and someone in the MP3, you know, in the, in the header had the artist's name. And, uh, that's how I found him. So then I Googled him and then sure enough, he's, like I said, he's still at drive. So I reached out to them and they were like, no, he can't, you know, he's, he's because they were with cumulate, they're with the clear channel or whatever. Yeah, clear channel, right. And they're like, no, we can't do it. And then, uh, uh, so then, yeah, it is. Well, it. it's the voice you have really, really sounds good. So I, I just you. want to compliment you on that. It's very, very well done. Is it? I knew, I knew something professional was going on there because I don't hear a sound like that on other podcast radio programs. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Now the problem is I just got to get my voice in, t- in check. <laughs> well, that's another story. We're all, we're always working on that, aren't we? It's, it, it, it's, I have a voice coach and, uh, it, well, 
I have a voice coach lined up. I I got to uh, get some revenue once again. My business partner and and everything, and he is out of Orlando, and he's done. He he is he's pretty well known. I had a voice and diction coach out of the University of, of Northwestern that was working with me, uh, but she has since retired. So, uh, because when I first moved to Chicago, I you know from Tennessee, you can imagine the accent. So I had to get rid of that. So that that's the oh, I battle. I had an accent growing up. I grew up in a Scottish household. Oh. So I got into radio as a junior in high school. I was uh, playing around with it. And someone said, you have an accent. I said, I do not. They said, where are you from? I said, dude, I was born right here in L.A. <laughs> but I was raised in a Scottish household. So the way that I said things, right. and I, I it came out with that that scottish brogue yeah and uh actually the work i did on myself to get that accent out of my voice is what made my voice the way it is today got it. okay and you got that deep baritone voice <sighs> well i work on it it gets a little bit raspy sometimes yeah. but um yeah, I, I I tell people I have a face for radio, so I better do well behind this uh, foam ball. <laughs> that's how I, I. That's me too. And unfortunately, I I made the mistake of putting my stuff up on YouTube. <laughs> I don't know if it was a mistake. It just <laughs> people, you know, that interaction, and that's the thing that we're going to start doing a little bit more with the shows. Like last night, uh, we had a technical issue with it. One of the computers crashed. But being able, when we're talking about something, to be able to actually show the people what we're talking about. I think that that's the power of YouTube. Because that was one thing that always got me about Art Bell's show was Art Bell would, all, you know, with Keith, he'd be like, well, my webmaster, it's on the webpage. It's like, I'm listening. I'm laying in bed. I'm listening. I don't, I don't have, I'm not going to get on and get on my computer and, and look at this. But now with YouTube, a lot of our listeners do come from YouTube and they're able to follow along and. So that's, that's why we're using that, that method. But let's uh, bring back, let's talk about the time. Because I'm sitting here as during the break, I, I thought about this. Because I wanted to get back into radio again. And I r obviously rang that bell out there. And, right. and so, and, and so I'm going I want to hear your story. How did, like, you don't just say, Hey, I want to get into radio and oh, no. stick, you're standing behind a mic. Yeah. How did that happen? It didn't happen on the first try. Did no, it? no. It, well, it did. All right. So long story. So Sandy and I were high school sweethearts. And one of the things that I started out doing was, uh, um, d uh, dances like our high school dances. I, I was a, a social well, awkward kind that? of, yeah, social yeah. awkward kind of guy. Uh, you never, never went to dances. Not, not that kind of person. I'm a geek, but I'm sitting there going, well, I got to go to dances, but I also want to make money. I, I like money. And so I realized that through technology, I could do dances. I could do be the DJ. And from there, uh, I used to rent my equipment from a place called Austin Audio in, in Tennessee. And when I would go pick up my equipment on Friday, it just happened that they had some issues with, with a leprechaun lighting board. And me being an electronics guy, computer geek, I went in there and programmed it for them. I fixed it for one of their con. These guys were doing concerts for. Oh, so, right. Yeah. Right, so you could control all the Fresnels. Yep. And, the and oh, cool. And so I program, I showed them how to program it. And so we got it up and running. So I was set for life for these guys where I never had to pay for the equipment, the rental of the equipment. So Sandy and I and another real good friend, uh, we we traveled all over the state of Tennessee doing dances. That was our job. Our neighbors here. Can you imagine this? It, uh, successful because we had people that believed it. Our neighbors would let us. You got 16-year-old kids, 17-year-old kids, two guys and a girl. Sitting there going, hey, can we borrow your van? Because we got to load our <laughs> equipment. And the, the our neighbors were so, they were like, yeah, sure. Our, you know, and, and they allowed us to use their van. And we would load the equipment up. It was awesome that they supported us that way. And, and so I always had a, that side of it. And then from, from graduating high school, went to college at Middle Tennessee, which is known for its recording industry program. Uh, I actually went for computer science and physics and 
At MTSU? At, yeah, at Middle Tennessee State. And mm-hmm. which is funny because uh, they had the WFOMOT or MOT, I can't remember the, the call letters, but they had a radio station there at the university and you could do like a work scholarship kind of thing. And in, in so mass I come. Yeah, in mass, so I said, I'm going to go do that. So I went there and I had to do all, all of my radio work and do the, uh, the, the checks, the air checks. And the problem was, is it was a French, they, they were known for jazz and we're not talking BB King jazz. We're talking eclectic <laughs> jazz. Like, you know, I learned really quick. You don't get a job at a university that has that is known worldwide for its recording industry uh unless you can speak the art because i was doing i did late night kind of i did a couple shows late night i could not pronounce any of the artists names i mean i just couldn't do it i'd have professors (laughs) calling i mean these are these are audio files these are the real deal these are professors that you know wrote dissertations on the guys that i was messing up their names so my life in radio didn't didn't last long, and then yeah, it doesn't really go over real big. It didn't go over real well. Speech was from Madame Mosel. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Madame Mosel. How do you say that word? I don't know yeah. how to say that word. Yeah, that and doesn't go very far. Exactly. But then I had buddies who were who were uh, radio guys in 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 Nashville, and they would invite me. We'd hang out and everything. They'd invite me into the studio. So this whole thing about automation was huge so and i was a computer guy so i would do the i kind of stayed in it a little bit because i stayed in with the automation part of it uh and so you were doing the cart setups i was doing well not that i was actually the whole thing is i was bringing in digital this is back in the early 90s i was like hey guys why are we using carts why oh, here why we don't were you? that's what we we're using them there for those of you that don't know the radio business these are yeah. little like almost like eight track yeah, things. cassettes. And you stick them in, and it has a, a a commercial loop. Yeah. And then you'll have like 16 of these actually in a machine. And when it comes time for that that commercial to run, it would just play the next tape. Yeah. And that that's how commercials were run in those days. Yeah, it, it was, was, it was, it was a, pretty low tech. It was all analog, you know. And so I I started I started to get into digital. What I did is I took a uh, old oh as a Korg. Uh, keyboard and i did i put this this radio stations all of their advertisement on each key oh how about that? on this cord on through mini and they would hit the, and that would play the ad and they were like well that's so i kind of stayed in it but then i i got into you know as, as a computer guy i got more and more into the 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 computer work and kind of got away from radio mm-hmm. and it's always been my passion to be in radio. I have an uncle who was known, he was named Polka Joe. He was known in, in the Michigan area for his, he was a, he was a DJ and, and, uh, and, and they played polka and he did polka. Yeah. He was a polka. <laughs> they called him Polka Joe and very well known in the Michigan area. You know, Michigan is, is like polka country, right? That in Wisconsin. So he was, he was, I guess it was kind of in my lineage in my blood, but then, um, what got me back into the podcasting was I just got aggravated with what I was seeing. Sure. You know, what I was seeing. So I said, well, heck, I got this thing, this technology. I'll give it a shot. So I built a studio in my house and mm-hmm. we grew our original podcast uh, from no- next to nothing to 20,000 listeners. Sometimes we had wow, 40,000 listeners. Really good. Yeah. And the podcast, we were going, but. What happened was I I just got it was politics right it was yeah. the Rush Limbaugh the the Alex Jones kind of stuff and it was it was getting to the point to where uh, I just every day I hated doing what I did because it was it was miserable it was just you know so much negativity sure. And sure. So I, I left and I, I went the other way. I, I, uh, it was a hobby for me, not a passion. I enjoyed it. I, and I really enjoyed it, but I never made any money at it. <laughs> uh, when I was an engineer in East Tennessee, by the way, I didn't live far from MTSU. I lived, uh, up on uh, Dominion Drive, which is, uh, right off of, uh, I think it was Cave Mill Road, yeah. which is 
right outside of Murfreesboro. Yeah, so. I know. Okay. Well, yeah. Same, same stomping grounds. Yep. But I ended up on early morning AM, six to eight AM. Sure. And then I would go to the plant at eight and, and work my normal, you know, 10 hour, 12 hour shift. Wait, but when you said plant, I, where at? Uh, I was in, this is in Morristown, Tennessee. So okay. it's way over on the east side, north of Knoxville. Okay. And we had a little AM station, WMTN, uh, 1310. And, uh, it had about 6,000 listeners when I got there, and I was mentored by the old guy that was doing a, a sort of wake-up AM sure. radio program where they talked about lost pets and who knows what. But over uh, four years, I built the audience to 100,000 people. We were encroaching on uh, Knoxville's market. Yeah because they were getting slaughtered with um, commercials and we were talking about really, really good content and, and it wasn't national politics. It was local politics. Mm -hmm. And wow, did we make a difference? We got two new high schools built. We got uh, a city council member. We changed the mayor. We changed the sheriff. I mean, we did a lot of positive things for that yeah. community. And that's where I really felt like I was, I was being, useful i was valuable to the community i sure. i moderated several debates you know for the candidates in that region and i really really felt involved so sure. ever since then that was in 94 uh, uh, so since 94 i've been in radio and i started this program in 2005 yeah wow so you you you've been at it at definitely a long long time yeah, and it's all been live calling, so it's you know it's rock and roll the whole the whole time. <laughs> there's there's no screener. There's yeah. you got to be able to take the irate calls and the supporters and be able to handle everything and and know your stuff because yeah. nothing is worse than being on the on the radio and and uh, being schooled by someone. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, now is your is your show your show though is geared more towards the paranormal though, just like ours. The only thing we don't do, we don't do ghosts, uh, and we don't do, uh, raw conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. Uh, other than that, we stay mostly toward the science. I actually call it the Alt America program. Uh, for those people that have ever read the book Atlas Shrugged, which yeah. was actually made into a small set of halfway decent movies, yep. there's a character in the book called John Galt. Yep. Well, in, the electronic vehicle industry. I'm John Galt. That's gotcha. that's that's my claim to fame in in the tech industry gotcha. uh, when it comes to vehicles. Gotcha. And then you spend quite a bit of time on on coast to coast. How did yeah. that? How did you get that gig? <laughs> well, I we wrote the first volume of the Ark of Millions of Years, which was a, a 560 page first volume in a in a quad that ended up being 2,000 pages nonfiction. Uh, we we flew all over the world to these ancient civilizations, did as much research as we could do, and I did the physics part. My co-author did the archaeology part, and we wrote this book about the advent of 2012 and what it meant to the end times and i thought it was a good book but honestly being honest with myself and cynical at the same time i told my co-author look uh ej you buy five copies i'll buy five copies we'll call ourselves authors and and that'll be it we will have done it well three months later it was number 38 on barnes and noble i had no idea that there were that many people out there where they're interested in that subject oh. matter. Next thing I know, I get a call from Lisa Lyon, and yeah. I'm on coast to coast. You're on coast to coast. There you go. Yeah, yeah. People wait for that call from from Lisa. But uh, well, I felt like I'd been just pushed out on the pitcher's mound at Yankee Stadium. Oh, yeah, I, I was so out of my league. Yeah. But that first interview, I did pretty well, and we sold a whole bunch of books off that program that yeah. night. Oh, absolutely. You know, and I'm finding that. And, you know, I, I love doing this. We're going to go to the break here because it's playing in my ear. But uh, I love doing this type of radio because we get to meet interesting, interesting individuals such as our guest tonight, Brooke Agnew. Uh, join us. I promise we're going to get back to some time travel conversation here instead of uh, a little geography, I guess, reminiscing about the good old days here at the Midnight Ocean Radio Show and podcast i am your host jeff norton hey make sure that you get out there and you join us on youtube by typing in the midnight ocean and when you're there 
cruise on by and hit that little subscribe button. That's very important to us. We'll be back in a little bit, in a few minutes, with our special guest, Brooke Agnew. This is the Midnight Ocean with Jeff Norton on the Paranormal State Radio Network. This is the Midnight Ocean Radio Show and a Podcast. I am your host, Jeff Norton. You can join me here every weeknight from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. Eastern Standard Time or on the web at www.themidnightocean.com. If you haven't had a chance, get out to the website. All of our shows are linked right there. 
You can Google any one of our guests or Google, you can search for any one of our guests. We have a new player called Spreaker. If you click on that, on the upper right hand corner there, you'll see three dots kind of says, hey, look, there's more here. You click on that and that will take you to all of our old podcasts as well. So, uh, but that is in the history, in the past. Let's talk about a little bit about the future with our very special guest, Brooks Agnew is joining us on, on the line as he is taking time from his busy schedule to to share with us. You know, when we talk about time travel a little bit, uh, what about the future? Is it possible under your model, like especially with the secret, because they, I mean, obviously we go into the future, we kind of set these bells that resonate back towards us and, and everything, but they, I guess, I guess my question is the physical future. Is it possible kind of to go into the physical future? Does well, that make sense? I, yeah, it does. But at the end of the day, what difference does it make? You know, whether ah. you go with your physical body or whether you go with your, your astral or your, your spirit body, because the, you know, the human beings are the only intelligence that we know of on the earth that can consider the future. Uh, even, you know, some of the more intelligent animals can uh, consider the past, I'm sure, because they have experience, wisdom that they gain, habits that they learn, mazes that they figure out how to negotiate. But when it comes to the future, we're the only ones that can behold that. And when, just to take a line from the movie Next, when we look at the future, it changes because we looked at it and that changes everything else. So when, when we're able to do this, when we don't just go through the future ad hoc, we already see what society looks like when you do that. Just look at the Middle East. They're going through the future one moment at a time. There is, there's no planning. Mm -hmm. If you want to see planning, you want to see long range planning for a future. Look at China. That's long range planning for a future. Yeah. Yeah. That's the way they run. That's the way their culture runs. Now, when we want to do that for ourselves, does it work a hundred percent of the time? The answer is no. And here's why, because what we're looking at, what we behold, what we exist in this matrix thing we call a reality is the average observation of all the sentient beings in this reality. That's what the universe is. The universe is the average of all the sentient beings in it. If one being were to leave this universe, the whole thing would collapse and have to start over again because the average sensation that we have, the freeways we drive on, the chairs we sit in, the food we eat and grow, all of that is a result of the average of all of the observational power of every being in this, in this realm. So we're talking about a population of approximately 7 billion alive people on the earth right now. In order for the average consciousness to shift of the whole world. And you know this because you know statistics pretty well if you're into computer modeling. Um, you have to change a significant amount of the population in order to make that average move. Correct. Even one really great mind is not going to move the average that much because you're dealing with a tremendously large number. Yep. So what does it take statistically to make that mean to make that average reality that top of the bell curve what does it take to make it shift well let's let's take a good point here let's look at say uh let's look at the bible just as an example here's a book that we have that is uh, widely accepted as a collection of prophetic writings in a library a, a, a biblio we call it the bible and uh, in this Bible, we see some future considerations. We see nations that they're used to seeing, Babylon and, you know, etc. But there's no America. 
In fact, there's no description of a country like America. Correct. There's no such thing as liberty. There's no such thing as freedom, private property. There's, there's no such thing as dream building or, or representative government. That doesn't exist in the Bible. How could the greatest nation in the history of the world not be in the Bible, not be in God's vision there as written so many thousands of years ago? Well, the reason is because in the mid 18th century, a group of very bright men looked into the future and said, if we were to create a nation, what would it look like? And what they did is they manifested a new nation. They changed the timeline. They said in the mid 1700s, we're not going to march down that road, that eschatological road to Armageddon. We're not going to be wiped out like that. We're going to create a new world because we already know what this world turns out like and we don't like it. Mm -hmm. And they did. And these United States is the result of their manifestation. That couple dozen men changed the world. And I'm saying that we can do that tonight right here on your radio program. We can pull enough minds together tonight with one vision for a different future because I can tell you, when I looked at the future back in 2007, I was looking at the year 2015. Mm -hmm. We didn't make it. Yeah. We didn't make it. We needed to do something radically different in 2007. We needed to change course. Or in 2015, the presidency itself was going to collapse. Correct. Well, here we are. We're in 2016. Yep. And the presidency is right on the edge. I mean, the Constitution is hanging from one very thin, frayed thread oh. right now. Oh, you're absolutely right. I mean, the... I think the big push now is that I was reading where they're saying Obama is going to do a, a last minute, you know, midnight executive orders, which is just going to, it's going to put the country from a, from a constitutional standpoint on its head. Well, I've been doing some research on the 22nd Amendment and his efforts to undo that. Mm -hmm. The 22nd Amendment, for those of you that don't know what it is, it limits the terms of the presidency to two. Now, that didn't exist before 1951. Right. They put it in place after Roosevelt because they said, look, it was kind of a custom before Roosevelt that each president would only serve a maximum of two terms. But now we're going to make it into law. And so they passed it in 1951, and it has restricted the term of the president. Mm -hmm. Well, the current president is a young man, and he is very, very popular. Mm -hmm. And his legacy isn't finished yet he doesn't want if hillary goes down trump runs unopposed yeah and i think what obama is trying to do right now is marshal the support through the un and also through the senate because they really think they're going to take over the senate in november they think they can undo the 22nd amendment and allow him to run a third term. And if he does, he will win. Yeah. Oh, without a doubt. Without a doubt. And he would win. I mean, I, I'm a firm believer that, it, you know, it, it's, I, I think people would rather have the status quo because at least you know what the status quo looks like versus the unknown. Because right now, I mean, that's the biggest complaint I have about our, our the candidates out there is is that you don't know I mean, they'll tell you whatever. I mean, whatever you want to hear at the, at the time. Yeah. Well, I mean, we don't, we don't want Hillary because she's all about the money and everybody well, knows it. She's a liar and, and yeah. we just can't stand. She's her. about the power. Her, yeah. Her voice to me sounds like two cats fighting in a garbage bag. <laughs> you know, it's funny that you say that. Sandy is not, is a, she is not, she is definitely apolitical. She doesn't either one. And when, whenever Hillary comes on, She's like, turn it. I can't yeah. listen to it. She was, I cannot listen to that voice. And and it's just, well, that's true. I'm just saying it'll be an easy sell. So yeah. w w when I looked at the future mm -hmm. to see what was being manifested, what I see happening now, unfortunately, is not a clear vision. Sure. It's scattered. It's going in a hundred different directions. 
most everybody is concerned about what's going to happen to them. Yeah. They don't really care what happens to the country. They really don't. They don't care who wins or loses the war. They don't care what bank goes broke. They don't care about treaties, nothing. The only thing they care about is what's in it for me. Yeah. I, and that's that's what's hurting our consciousness as a nation right now. I was going to ask you that because a lot of the, like a lot of the political, even when I was doing mine and everything was all negative. It was all, and and there's so much of that out there in the ethos. And, and it's, it's a continuing, like, it's almost like the, the, I think of the, uh, uh, doctor who the, the thumping, the hands of time, you know, that, that, that pounding. And it's just, you know, every show, every podcast, everything, it's the same thing over and over and over again. And you actually think that that mass consciousness, because everybody's thinking that way, that it is actually driving us to that end point? Well, that's what they want you to believe, that okay. the media that's out there right now is just a reflection of society. But you and I know that the machinations of how society works is quite the opposite. If media keeps beating the drum, keeps playing the propaganda, keeps putting the talking points out there, society becomes a reflection of the media. And you, well, yeah, I mean, I, I thought today, even with what's going on in your state, you know, right now, I'm like, this is media led. This would Absolutely. have never. This would have never made the the news, but it's the media. You know, you got the twenty four cycle now, and it it's like, wh- why is this even being? Why are you even giving credence? Why are you even allowing this to go on the air? Yeah, well, I know why they're doing it. It's all about money and ratings, and you know, keep eyeballs glued to us. But I think it, it's highly irresponsible. Well, that's part of it. The other part of it is that the media had a narrative that talked only about emails and about Hillary's health yeah. and about how tired she looked and they needed to get that out of the headlines like right now. Yeah. Gotcha. I get it. And the Clint, the Clintons have been doing that for a long time. That's yeah. what the war in Kosovo was all about. Yeah. That war was fought to get a blue dress off the headlines yeah. and not to win a war. Yeah. Wag, wag the dog. Right, the the classic movie Wag the Dog. That's exactly right. Uh, John or Klein was a, was a genius when he put that out. Yeah, I was going to tell you. Actually, I don't know if you saw this, but uh, on on the chat room, Truth, Truth Frequency News. And by the way, I do apologize. Uh, first rule of broadcasting: get your get your your guest name correct. It's Brooks Agnew. I, yeah. I got that. Hey, I, it's, I got. Well, I just got, call me dude. Dude, hey you, hey you. I don't know you well enough yet, but I, I think down the road I, we can probably get that way. But it, it is funny because truth. I will tell you, truth frequency news is like your guest name is Brooks <laughs> and stuff. But they just posted up here the apparently the national the North Carolina National Guard and extra extra state troopers will be sent to Charlotte to help with Charlotte PD. Yeah. Yeah, that happened a couple exits down from where I live. I I was listening to the police scanner last night for a couple of hours as this thing developed. And, and, you know, I have to tell you, if you told me that I had to go organize 200 people to go do something, anything, I don't care, Mm -hmm. egg roll, uh, you know, canvassing a neighborhood for a candidate, I honestly don't think I could do it in a month. I couldn't get 200 people together. But somehow 200 people got together last night and shut off interstate 85 yeah you know how hard it is to shut off oh. nine lanes of traffic yeah. it takes a lot yeah well they did well, it yeah but they the people that organized it the people that were getting oh. the people out there they were paid to yes. do that yes i mean george so i mean it's already been documented george soros is a huge funder of the of the black lives matter movement and north carolina is yeah. ground zero for Hillary right now. Yeah. She has to win North Carolina. Yep. And the candidates are so close together right now. I mean, they're like five votes apart in this country, yep. in this state, yep. North Carolina. She has to win this state. And so this is all orchestrated. Yep. And what's going on down there tonight 
is more of it. Of course, tonight they decided that they needed some uh, pro NBA gear, so they uh, looted the Charlotte Hornets uh, official store. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it, it, I, it's a touchy subject because the thing is, is that they're obviously and and I mean I can see I have a real I have a really dear friend of mine who said Jeff and he's and he and he's black and he said Jeff he goes when you get pulled over by a cop. I get it. I mean, he goes, when you get pulled over by a cop, you're pissed off because it's, you know, you're going to lose 250 bucks. He goes, when I get pulled over by a cop, I'm afraid that I'm lo- I might lose my life. I'm never, and, and he goes, until you can put yourself in that position. And I, and I understand that, you know, it, it's, I mean, this guy is a lawyer. He's, he's a, you know, pretty smart, articulate guy. I don't think you'll ever run into that issue. Uh, but, it, you know, I just can't imagine living in that fear. So I do have some empathy for for certain. But but then again, I, I have zero tolerance for people that are going to loot. I, I think the minute the looting starts, your your movement's over. We're shutting you down. And, you know, <laughs> you can stop, stop, I don't know, reinforcing. Well, well looting is the main reason, one of the main reasons that, that these things happen. Yeah. Now, you're talking to a gearhead. Okay, I've been in the automotive business my entire life, except for a couple stints in in chemistry. And I've gotten my fair share of tickets, all for speeding. Yeah. And I never one time feared for my life. Not once. No, me neither. That's what I'm saying. I've never feared for it either. I never, never, ever have. But like I said, my friend, he's not irrational. He's like he's like that moment that the police officer comes up to your door. You are you are literally in, afraid of, of something. You know something's going to happen until that officer says, "Hey, you know, I, you know, you know why I pulled you over?" And yeah, he just slow it down. And he goes, "Then then you relax." And he goes, "And part of it is is me, you know." And he admits it. He's honest enough. He has enough integrity that he says a lot of it is is probably not based on any fact. He goes, "But the reality of it is is that." Is that you? You are afraid that you're going to lose two hundred fifty dollars in tickets, and now I'm going to. I'm afraid I'm going to lose my life. And I just, I just don't get it. Yeah. I mean, I, I've been around a long time, and I've been in some pretty rough situations, and I've had to talk to law enforcement a time yeah. or two, not, not because of me, but because of what was going on yeah. in the area. And they get, they get excited. Yeah. They get excited, but when people have firearms. They feel like their life is more important than the guy that they're arresting with the gun. Correct. Correct. And so they're going to take action. Well, and and that's the other thing, too, is I, I don't understand these, these people. And I guess that might be a little bit different because when when I get pulled over by a cop or, or, or a police officer, I, I'm polite to him. I, and sure. it, I've always been raised. That's the guy with a gun. You don't know that. You know, that's go to Andy of Mayberry. Yeah, yeah. I'll you know? be like, I'll be, I'm like, I was told very young in age, you know, from from you know parents and stuff, get arrested, go to jail, and and where don't be locked on with the police. You'll never win. No, you'll never win. <laughs> you know, so just I mean, shut up and and do what you got to do, and and you know, don't negotiate with them, don't talk to them, do exactly what they do because remember they have a gun. And that's the thing is that we've gotten into society though, and it's all over. It's prevalent, and we're we're kids these days, and young people these days, they have no no sense of of respect for authority, none. I mean, well, even I just don't I don't understand that. But if you respect them, yeah, and and they're going to respect you. They're going to yeah. treat you with dignity. They're going to write you your ticket and you're going to go your very may, may your merry way and pay your fine. No, I mean, and one thing I listen to what they tell you to do. Yeah. I mean, one thing I, I, I always do is like, Hey, I've, I've done this many a times. I get out of tickets more than I get tickets. I've had a ticket a long time. And the reason being is because I, you know, an officer, he'll ask me, he's like, do you know how fast you're going? I said, well, obviously I was over the speed limit and, and I appreciate you the fact that you stopped me, you know, because I was I was distracted and not paying attention, and I need to get I need to be focused. I, I start playing the "Hey, you saved my life, thank you very much" role, and and then they're like, "Well, let give me a driver's license," and they go back and they I always get a warning because I always tell them I'm like, "No, thank you for I was distracted, I wasn't paying attention, and um, I let the speed get away from me, and I appreciate you telling me to slow down." 
Oh. Well, I, I had to redefine what a good driver is. I thought a good driver is somebody that can do a four wheel drift and not hit the curb. <laughs> but a good driver is somebody that can not get a ticket, stay within the law. Yeah. And besides, I considered it a personal mission because I got kind of mad that the cops were sitting there on the side of the road revenue and all day. So I said, look, if, if I'm going to lead by example, I want to get these cops off the road as much as anybody else because I don't like driving through uh, a speed tax. Yeah. Yeah. So the only way to get them off the road, people, is to starve them out. Yeah. Because right. they, if they don't write tickets, they don't make money. If they don't make well, money, they got to start laying cops off. And it's as simple as that. Yeah. Well, the, the other part of it, too, and this actually goes to what Truth, Truth Frequency News in the chat room says, well, what do you do? what's the answer with dealing with abusive cops? I mean, my answer, is, and, you, and you're all right, because a lot of these police officers are under the guise, they have quotas that they have to fill, and they, they do. It is, it is a speed tax. It's a tax. It's, that's all it is, my, a speed tax. My thing is, look, remember, they have the gun, and and they can say whatever they want to say against you, so you're – so, so my thing is, is turn on your microphone, uh, on your cell phone, or your, if you have cop watch or whatever it is, turn that on. Make sure I won't, don't have any interaction with law enforcement. Um, wait until you kind of gauge their demeanor before you engage them anymore. Don't do exactly what they tell you to do. And, and then once you gauge their demeanor and it, you know, you can pick up pretty quick. And if they're going to be a complete a hole, or if they're going to be, you know, pretty cool to you, and then 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 go from there. It's like any any other social outing. But yeah, I mean, the, the, there are abusive there are abusive cops. They have a chip on their shoulder. They have a bad day. They spill coffee in their lap. Whatever. Well, there's there's a way to stop that too. And it's not all the burden is on us. <laughs> if you go to the sheriff's department, go to their website and yeah. look at their recruiting films. Yeah. What you'll see is you know. Those you'll see sheriffs working at the courthouse, uh, directing traffic, helping with safety. Go look at the city police recruiting and you'll see a totally different demeanor. You'll see military movements, yelling, uh, flat tops, a drill sergeant, and the kind of guy that they're hiring as a city cop is usually former military. Yeah. And they've already killed people. What yeah, they're, they're trying to do now is hire these bad guys as cops. Yeah. That's preventable by just taking a different approach to who do we want protecting and serving our city. Yeah. I'm sorry to say in a lot of cases, and I've seen as much police brutality films as I can stomach. Oh. And it, it makes me sick to yeah. see it. Yeah, I yeah, I mean, I haven't experienced that. So, like I said, I haven't. But you're right on the, on YouTube. I've seen things on YouTube, and I'm a firm believer. Lock those. Lock. The one thing that I don't understand with these officers, if you're in, involved in a shooting, if I if I am involved in a shooting, I go I go down and get questioned, and I can never figure out why an officer, when you shoot someone else, you have to. There's a mandatory 48 hour wait period before that. No. He shot someone. He needs the answer to that. I mean, it's like it's like anything else. If I was a truck driver and I was in a in a in a trucking accident, the first thing they do is they take you, you know, take your blood if you're alive, they take your blood, they take your urine, they take and then they interrogate the crap out of you. And and so right there, that that ought to be gone right off the bat. Look, I, I, I used to combat shoot with the State Highway Patrol in, in Kentucky, mm -hmm. and I have good friends that are retired police officers. Do you know that I don't? I only know one state trooper that ever even drew his service weapon? I, yeah, I don't know any. And I know exactly. a lot of cops. Now, I know a lot I of cops. Is the first thing a lot of cops do is draw their weapon. Yeah. And that can be changed. That can be changed on the city level. That has to change. That that's you know, and that's and Shannon Sharp had a great argument. He said you had a guy that massacred at Colorado and no one shot him. You had a guy that massacred people in a church and no one shot him. They you know they 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 took him to a Burger King stand because they felt hungry. You know, you're right. I mean, these cops do draw these weapons way too quickly, way too easily. I mean, I've I I, I do you, nowadays. You know I do who, agree. With that. Uh, well, there's another talk radio host out there. His name is Jim Webb. Very, yeah. very fine guy. Yeah. I think you've got a break coming up. Yeah, we do. We do. Hey, thank you. 
I, I always tell when I'm talking to a fellow radio guy, I don't have to tell him that. <laughs> Most guests want to talk over the music. <laughs> it's, you will never win. <laughs> can you turn that music down? Yeah, I'm talking. Yeah, 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 you can never win. So, so we'll take a quick break. We'll come back and we're talking with Brooks Agnew. Uh, he is known for his Coast to the Coast appearance and also his show that you can catch on Sunday nights as well. But we'll take a quick break. We'll come back. We'll continue this thought process, this line of of questioning. And uh, but we will we will bring back some more time travel uh, topics. So you're listening to the Midnight Ocean Radio Show and podcast. We'll be back in a few. This is the Midnight Ocean with Jeff Norton on the Paranormal State Radio Network. with Jeff Norton on the Paranormal State Radio Network. (laughs) 
That is right, Andrew. This is uh, the Midnight Ocean Radio Show and Podcast. I am your host, uh, Jeff Norton. Join us on the web at www.themidnightocean.com. That is themidnightocean.com for show replays and news and information about our guests and upcoming guests. We try to keep the calendar up to date as much as we can. Unlike tonight, though, we we actually had a fill-in. I will tell you that Gerald is going to be joining us tomorrow. I'm going to be doing a... He's in the Netherlands. So we're going to do a recorded show, and then we'll get that out uh, to you guys as a bonus set uh, this week. So we'll just we'll just post it out there. There's no reason to use it as filler or anything, but uh, get that to you. Uh, the other thing that is very important, if you are out on the Midnight Ocean... If you haven't done so already, hit that little like button for Facebook and also the subscribe button for YouTube. That's very important to us. That's how we are going to grow this audience. And, you know, I will tell you, as we grow and as I get better at the craft of broadcasting and stuff, we do have a syndicator that is looking at us. But there are some things, you know, you got to learn to crawl. I get it. You just can't jump into this and and think that you're going to be successful and everything. But, uh, you know, the listenership, though, will definitely, definitely help us. If you're listening to us on Spreaker, also make sure that you you follow us. We need to get at least 100 listeners before we're even considered for iHeartRadio, which is also a big jump for us. But I do understand it's all training. It's all in due time. And like I said, we'll eventually get there, though. I, I have no doubts about that. And I now know why we have been so successful to this point. After talking with Brooks Agnew, our very special guest who's joining us on the Skype line. You know, you know Brooks, I, I was thinking, I now understand why we're able to get the guests we're able to get. Because it's that whole, the whole bell. It's the whole resonance. The fact that I put out there, these are the guests I want on my show. And we are doing what we need to do to get those guests short of, short of stalking them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I feel greatly privileged to be on your program tonight. Thank uh, you. I think you're doing a fine job down there in the Sunshine State. Sunshine State. So, hey, and if you need to escape there, if things get a little hairy, you're more than welcome to come down. <laughs> That's right. You know, a Legion Air does round trips, round trips for 78 bucks to Kissimmee. Really? Yep. Orlando, uh, I'm sorry, Orlando, Orlando, Sanford Airport. You know uh, what? From Concord, like two miles from my house. You know that, I. you're correct. And let me tell you why. My oldest daughter, she they live in, in Winston-Salem. So she moved down here. Uh, they moved down here with our grandson being born to kind of help. And then they decided uh, last month to move back home. And I remember, I, uh, yeah, I remember her, her boyfriend when, uh, when Pat got his ticket, he came into kissing me and I was like, why are you coming into kissing me? Why not Tampa? And he was saying, because there's a, you can fly down there. And he said it was like 70, 80 bucks. Heck yeah. It's really cheap. And it's not a puddle jumper. This is a 300 Airbus. Wow. Why is that? Is there is there manufacturing down here or something that they're? Oh, there's tons. We go down there for expos. Uh, sometimes yeah. we just go down for the weekend. It, it it flies every Friday and every Monday. Okay. So we can leave here Friday afternoon at three, get down there, spend the weekend, come back on Monday, and it's seventy nine bucks round trip. You almost wow. can't drive it for that. Wow, wow. Well, if you're ever in the neighborhood, well, the 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 old SS Minnow got swamped with the hurricane. We're we're having to, it actually took on water. And uh, we're having to replace the motors. But if, once we get the motors down, if you ever want to come on down and do some sports fishing, you're more than welcome to, to, to give me a call. We'll, we'll go out. We do that all the time on the weekends. Yeah, yeah you, you you bass fishermen, catfish fishermen in freshwater, you ain't lived until you no. deep sea fished. That's that's where it's at. I, I hooked into a, is a 45-pound grouper. Oh yeah, and that thing it, it wore. It was funny because we were we were fishing for stripe, you know, and 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 trout, and so I hooked into this grouper, 
And I thought for sure I had a, you know, a skag or something. I was sitting there, uh, 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 not an eel, a, um, we call them skags, but they're, uh, the manta rays. And I thought for sure, because they, they kind of lay their fins out. So they're hard to pull up, but this gag grouper, this thing was just, it was, it was about 45 pounds, 50 pounds. And it was hilarious because the guy I was with, he's, you know, good friend of mine. He's like, well, wait until you hook into about a 900 pound shark. <laughs> out there no thanks yeah I mean, that's 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 great fishing out there i just yeah. i just love to go out there and the water is so beautiful yeah i i, I love it you got to go out to the coast but like i said we have a sports fisher that i got sunk but we're redoing the, uh, the we pulled the engines out last week and what a mess i mean we're completely having to redo the whole interior of the boat i almost think it would have been better to let it sink <laughs> just take the insurance money. I was like, I hey, can't say that, but uh, I didn't have anything to do with it <laughs> and stuff. So I'm, I'm having to re restore it and it's uh, never, never fun. And, you know, you talk about intimidating, having talking to you with your background, especially with the radio stuff. It, it's, uh, it, it it's intimidating. Well, I'm not. I'm not here to intimidate. No, no I'm here to help. I'm your friend. I, I know. I know. It's just you know. It's just one of those things that you always, uh, uh, you know, when you when you have someone in the industry that you want to aspire to be in, and not just be in it, but actually make a difference. I mean, my my goal is to bring the classic, you know, the old Art Bell shows back, the Mel's Hole, the. You know, I've always said that if if you want to fly your airplane over Area 51, please call me. <laughs> you know, <they're laughs> those shows, and that's my goal here is to really bring not the so main, um, not the the mainstream topics, but to bring the really obscure, crazy. I don't want to say crazy, but the things that people need to hear. Yeah, well, you 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 find that. You know, for a long time, we thought radio was kind of a lost art. I mean, yeah. My grandfather and I used to sit there and listen to baseball games in the afternoon. Yeah. But, you know, talk radio. I mean, in the early 90s, we were starting to get vehicles that didn't even have AM radios in them. Correct. Because no one was listening to AM. Yeah. And then you had uh, Coast to Coast came along, Rush Limbaugh came along, and it, it put the AM back in right. the vehicle. Yeah. And, you know, to get... A hundred, five hundred, six hundred, uh, affiliates carrying your program. You're, you're a major dog out there. Yeah. But then the crazy thing happened during the Clintons. They allowed, or during Clinton administration, they allowed these giant media moguls to go out and buy up all these radio stations and they bought up thousands of them. Correct. You know, these AM blowtorches are out there with 30,000, 40,000, 50,000, some have 75,000 watts. Yeah. They just bought them all up. Yeah. Now, you might think, gee, that's a really great thing. These small station owners got to sell their station and cash out after 25 or 30 years of running an AM station. But a terrible thing happened. Um, I was going to say Earth Explorers. That's what I call the people on my uh, listeners. No, that's fine. Go ahead. Go ahead. A, a terrible thing happened, Earth Explorers, and that is that only six narratives yes. got put out there. Yep. All the talking points began to line up. And then the programs like Art Bell and like some of these other programs that were really cracking open the ice of the, the mores and the, uh -huh. and the uh, fables that we grew up with, they started to go away. Yeah. And even, I have to say, even some of the big dogs out there, coast to coast, uh, among them is starting to become more corporate. And it's been yep. happening for a long time. And that's why I believe programs like Midnight Ocean and others become popular because we are not owned by anyone. Mm -hmm. We are, we are really the free press. Yep. And what, what's happened is, these little pockets of audiences, 2,000, 5,000, 20,000 listeners, we're making a difference. We're starting to form these pockets of light yeah. and enlightenment all around the country. And really, anybody can listen in, but you know how hard it is to really get a big listener audience in this genre. Yeah. There's a thousand new radio hosts that come on every quarter and a thousand that leave because yeah. they just run out of things to say. Yeah. But some of us stay and some of us get good at it and we end up building an audience. And 
it's an audience of light. Yeah. It's an audience of hope. And yeah. that's the difference. We're not sowing fear. Yeah. We're sowing hope. Yeah. We're trying. No, I mean, I, I agree with you. I mean, there are no red phones under my desk. I don't have to worry about <laughs> corporate. And yeah, the way that exactly. we, even with our syndicators, yeah, I have a, I have a company that wants to syndicate us and they're the same company that syndicates, uh, CBS and uh, a lot of the CBS shows and the radio programs. And, and they were like, well, what are you going to do? This is the problem I had with my other podcasts is once we, you start syndicating, you do have to conform. I said, look, I said, this is my show. This is the way we do it. And oh, by the way, if you're a mom and pop radio station, we give you th those breaks that we do. I don't advertise over those breaks. Those are your breaks as the AM station. So you get eight minutes an hour to do whatever you want to do uh, for, for radio. And uh, the only thing I ask is you're not going to dictate to me how I'm going to do my show. And, and, well, the reason that we do that, I believe, the reason that we have this passion about this, you do and I do and all the other, well, not all of the hosts, but most of the hosts that are out there, the reason we have this passion is because we see a gap between what the media should be doing and what they are doing. No. We nominated Julian Assange and Edward Snowden for the Nobel Peace Prize because what they did is expose the crimes that governments and corporations actually perpetrated. Correct. You can't say that telling the world about a crime is a crime. Yeah. Unless you're the criminal. Yeah. Yeah. No. So, yeah. I, you know, my thing though was Snowden, because I, I was in the same boat. I'm in the same boat as he is in some mm -hmm. regard. I, I, I don't like his approach though. I think where I, where he lost the crime, but then again, I, I can't, I can't criticize him because I didn't have people shooting at or possibly wanting to kill me. I didn't have senators sitting on the, on the house floor, on the Senate floor saying this guy ought to be taken out. He ought to be assassinated. Well, the thing yeah. that impresses me about Edward Snowden and also Julian Assange is that they are both extremely brilliant individuals, Correct. extremely well-spoken. I have never heard either one of them misspeak. Yes. And I've never heard either one of them been drawn into saying something that isn't true mm -hmm. and isn't right. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the other hosts I see out there are, are much more inflammatory. Oh, yeah. Uh, they, they say things I would never say, and I'm sure they say things they wish they could take back. But not these two guys. These two guys are impeccable. Their integrity is in my book, and mm -hmm. I've listened to hours and hours and hours of them talk, mm -hmm. is unassailable. Yes. They, they have impeccable integrity. You know, um, somebody, I was speaking at a Boy Scout uh, conv uh, banquet one time, and I said in the speech, there was probably, I don't know, 1,500 boys there and about that many scouters. And I said, listen, here's the trouble with where we are today. We need men of integrity. Mm -hmm. And the best place to get a man of integrity is from a boy of integrity. Yep. And for my money, the best place to build a boy of integrity is in the Boy Scouts of America. Correct. Correct. And it doesn't, it's no surprise. I look at Trump's kids and I realize you can't fake good kids. Yeah. You know, I, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly there. I, and, and that's why I think that's why the, you know, certain segment of, of the American populace and political stream, that's why they're attacking the family. That's why they're attacking these, these groups and, and infiltrating them. Call it what it is, but it's infiltration. Um, yeah, I'm a Boy Scout and I can't imagine having a, a, a den leader or, or a, my pack leader being anything other than, than who he was. I mean, the guy, my, my troop leader for our Scottish troop was a POW. Uh, he was an air force uh, pilot mm -hmm. and he was a POW. Mm -hmm. You talk about integrity. You know, well, it, because, because we, you know, we know that a scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, obedient cheerful, cheerful, thrifty, brave, brave clean, clean, and reverent. reverent. You yep. get a guy that's all those things. You've got the right guy. Yep. Yep. I can't remember. I can't believe that I remembered that. I guess it's something that's just ingrained in you. 
Yeah. Well, you had a good scoutmaster. I had a great scoutmaster. I mean, this guy was a hero. I mean, we're talking <laughs> hero. We're we're talking. He this guy. Uh, he he was known in the Air Force. He was uh, and he was definitely a, he was awesome. This guy. Let me tell you, most scout troops. When I was in the scouts, it was in Northern Michigan when I was a young man, and when uh, you know most scout troops might do the jamboree or something like that. We every other weekend we camped in the woods and we sure. did something. Oh, we, that's awesome! He created a polar bear. What the polar bear merit badge? Yeah, sure, it, the polar bear. Absolutely. Well, well, hold on. His polar bear was. You have to, you know, we our average snowfall in northern Michigan was about 341 inches of snow a year. I reckon so. So we had to sleep. The only thing that we were allowed to take with us was a mummy bag, which was a, you know, military green, military mummy bag. And that was good to like, you know, 40, 30 below, but that was it. We had to build our own shelters. We had to trap our own food. He shot. He showed us how to do. Can you imagine today's uh, all of the the certain liberal groups getting upset? You got a bunch of kids out there learning how to do snare traps and, and yeah. capture their own food. Mm-hmm. But no, he he did, and that's how what you had to do to earn the mer- the polar bear was you had to build your own shelter, and basically it means digging down below a, a tree because it was hollowed out. Hope the god nothing's down there. Uh, that was the concerns. You have other animals that would uh, the same thing. They would burrow down next to these big pine trees that was open, and you had to sleep in there. And then you you had to cook. You had to trap and cook your own your own food, and uh, just incredible man. But every two every two weeks we camped. Every two weeks we were doing something. Now, I have a feeling that that would uh, that would be pretty rough for the special little snowflakes we have today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. Well, then my dad retired and we moved to Tennessee and they were like, oh, you can join the scouts there. So I went to the first scout meeting. I'm like, well, when are we camping? And they're like, oh, we're going to go to the Jamboree. And I'm like, well, what do we do before then? We're, you know, are we going to, are we going to set up a rope ladder course or lat? What are we? Uh, and they were like, oh, hey, slow down, <laughs> slow down. <laughs> I'm like, well, come on. It, you know, it was. Yeah, it's all there. And I, yes, I did go to a Camp Hiawatha in Munising, Michigan. There, there actually is a Camp Hiawatha. <laughs> Boy That's Scott amazing. Camp. So yeah, we hiked the Mishawaka Trail all up around there, the foothills of the Smokies, yeah. Mount Leconte, and it's it's amazing. Yeah. That is amazing training. I had eighteen boys, only four of them had dads, wow. and they still remember to this day the things that they learned yeah. in that scout troop. It it changed their oh, lives. I, changed mine. I, I can tell you, fifty miles on the Escanaba, up, you know, paddling the Escanaba, and oh wow, I mean, we did that. I mean, it it's yeah, I mean, it, those are those are uh, those are parts in your life in which you don't realize when you're doing it how important they are, but you learn. There's a there's a lot of valuable lessons. I you do yeah. if you have a good scoutmaster because only two percent of boys make it to Eagle. I'm the yeah. father of two Eagle Scouts, right. and I I could not be more proud of them. Yeah, I made it to at, at Hiwa. I made it to life. And then my dad, and basically what happened was I made it to life and then we moved to Tennessee. And I yeah. just, and I, the troop was horrible. And I just, I don't know. I just, I was so well. Part of it too is I loved Northern Michigan. I, you know, if you've ever been up that part of the, of the country, it's, it's this God's country. And, um, you know, the, go from there to, to Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Yeah. It's a big difference. <laughs> it's a huge flat, difference. Flatlands of uh, Murfreesboro. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. It's a huge difference. The fact that you're, you know, you're a Yankee of the most, you know, order of the highest order trying to fit in. With, yeah. Well, with, they're, they're not too much about that in Tennessee. Yeah. Kentucky they are, but not so much yeah. in Tennessee. Well, Murfreesboro was kind of the uh, center of the wagon wheel of the, of the early country, being the fourth, fourth nation and a fourth state in the country. Yep. But, but, but the point that I was trying to make is, that just those little things that we did, those camping trips, tying knots, merit badges, mm-hmm. all that stuff, it changed those boys' lives forever, and it changed their children's lives. So when we look at what we're doing here on the radio, speaking to people out there listening at uh, at 1 o'clock in the morning Eastern time, how are we changing their lives? What can we give them that tomorrow morning they wake up and they take to work with them 
to change other people's lives with. Oh. And that is giving them the hope that there is truth out there. Oh. You don't have to just listen to propaganda all day like you do on the mainstream media. Oh. There's, there's real truth. There's real perspective out here that yeah. you can, you can hear every single day. Yeah. There's, in I hope there's intelligence. That, that's my goal too, is to be in intelligent, just not to be a ranter. Well, you have yeah. another guest coming on tonight? <laughs> no, no, not at all. But no, it is, <laughs> I mean, think about it. I mean, you know, you can either be, I mean, there's two types of media. And right now there's the media in which they open up your head and pour in information, right? And it's the information they want you to have or the type of media that makes you think that, that presents to you a, a different opinion or a different viewpoint. And then you, I, I always say, I'm not doing your homework here, but I'm going to present, I'm going to give you the opportunity to understand that there's a different way of thinking out there. And it's up to you to choose that. It, it, you know, I'm not going to tell you this is, you know, when I had McCartney Green, I'm not going to tell you that, that her philosophies and her belief systems and, and what she believes, you know, is the way that you should go. I'm just going to present it to you. And then, and even like with you tonight, I'm going to say, hey, look, yeah, I get it. I, I can tie it into things that I've done and it does work. Now you can choose to, to set that bell, that goal out there in your distance future or your near future and ring that bell and then try to follow it and try to hone in on it. That's up to you, but, and, and that's intelligent radio. That's intelligent media. Well, I see other hosts in their own genre do this. I see the, the investment hosts do it. I see the real estate hosts doing it. Uh, I see the auto mechanic hosts doing it. They're teaching people things that they can use in their everyday lives. Yeah. So what do we do when we're talking about the average consciousness of the world and how we mean to change it? What, how, what kind of tools do you hand somebody to be able to do that? Because uh, a lot of people feel like they've just been handed the big end of the bat and told to go to the plate and hit a home run. That It's just not going to work. You don't have the right tool. You're not standing right. You're not holding it right. We, What we want to do is give you enough information to crack that old dried armor that you've been wearing around every single day so some light can get in. Uh -huh. And once the light gets in, you're going to go, you're going to slap your own forehead and go, oh, wow. yeah, that's why that's that way. That's why I'm here. That's how I can make a difference. All right. I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> Give me the tools. All right. <laughs> and I'm, so, I'm just going to go. I'm just going to let you know. I'm going to blow through this break because I can, because <laughs> I think, well, because I think this is important. I think that I think that it needs to be uninterrupted. So I'm just going to let you know you have the full, however long it takes to 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 do this to All right. give us our tools. All right. So when we consider the planet Earth, uh, many people think they form as hollow spheres or that we live in a molten ball floating around through space. Let's just set that aside just for a moment. One of the feelings that the ancients had, and many modern people have, is that the planet itself is somehow alive, that it has the ability to self-correct, that somehow it is floating through the cold blackness of space, but it is so full of life. It gives so much to every single life form that's on it, that it, it surely has to have some spirit to it. Uh, the ancient uh, Indians thought that, uh, the Mayans and Incans all thought that, the uh, Babylonians spoke about life force coming out of the planet. When I put the books together for birth, that's exactly what I, I claimed from those ancient civilizations. It's that Earth is made up of two different planets. One is a higher energy planet. The other is a lower energy planet. Consider the high energy one, the spirit, and the lower energy one, the temporal or the body. And like any body, at some point in time, they're going to come back apart. Now, somebody asked me one time, well, that's silly. How can two forms of matter occupy the same space at the same time? And the answer is that for Earth, there's a lot of space 
in what makes up Earth. In fact, a neutrino could travel through a solid light year of dirt and not hit a thing. That's how much space there is in the molecules, the matter that makes up Earth. It's quite porous, not very dense at all, not like a black hole, not like a, a brown dwarf. Picture it like a five-gallon bucket full of glass marbles. It's as full as you can get of marbles. But then I can take another bucket of water and I can pour it into that bucket and fill in all the gaps between the glass marbles. Now I have two forms of matter occupying the same bucket at the same time, glass and water. It's not such a great stretch because if you think of the human body, we're the same thing. We're bone and metal and water in this bag that we walk around in. But inside, we are this animated, energetic, alive, leaping being. In fact, I'm pretty sure the people listening to this program right now have often been surprised when you look in the mirror sometimes and you say, whoa, who is that guy? Or who's that woman? I, I'm not that old woman in that in that mirror. I am this leaping gazelle of a being with wings. And it's true. You are two forms of matter occupying the same space at the same time. You are alive and planet Earth is alive. Except you're not alone. You've got approximately 7 billion other people alive on this planet right now with you. So you've got this gigantic consciousness symbiotic relationship going between the souls of Earth and the soul of Earth. And it is resonating at an ever-changing frequency. I think the science is showing us right now that that frequency is beginning to go up in frequency. As it does, it's going to leave some of those souls behind because they're not ready for it. They won't take it. What they think about is so dark and so evil that it cannot resonate at those higher frequencies. But what you will see, and it's happening right before your eyes right now, open your eyes and you'll see it. What you will see is that society is going to start separating itself. The good and wholesome and righteous people of the planet are going to become unaware of the wicked and fearful and dark um, souls of this world. They'll become unaware of each other. It's called the Grand Division, and it's prophesied in virtually every ancient text that it's going to take place about this time. Another unique thing about this time is that we have, in a very short amount of time, less than a 100 years, figured out how to master the resources of this planet so that we can support 7 billion souls. We could actually support 10 or 15 billion souls on this planet pretty easily with the science and technology that we have without ruining the planet. I honestly believe it's never been that way before on this planet. So where did all these souls come from? I think there are also people listening to your program tonight that believe they don't belong here. They're not from here. They're from someplace else. Oh, they might have been born in a body here. But their spirit, their soul, the person that they are inside this body came from somewhere far away, maybe even in a different form, on a different world. But now you're here. Why? You came here because this planet is getting ready to go through that transition. And it is such a rare, such a special occasion that the very most powerful souls in the entire universe come here to experience it. Now, you've got to say to yourself at this point, how in the world does this have anything to do with buying a new couch or a new car? What does it have anything to do with building up a 401k or, or retiring and moving into a, a mobile home? It has nothing to do with that. What has happened is this world has tricked so many people into thinking that you have to have certain things. That life is about filling your garage with toys and your wall with art. And then you die. And you missed it. You missed the whole purpose for being here. In fact, when a soul leaves this world, 
And believe me, death is so easy, so easy. You cannot believe how easy it is. You never feel the pain of death. I don't care if you burn to death or drown or run or run over by a car and suffer for six months in the hospital and then die. When you're dead, you will never remember that pain. But the one regret you will have, not that you didn't finish the house or finish the book or see your grandkids grow up. The one thing that you will regret are the people that you leave behind. It is the relationships that are in the most important thing. So if I were to say to the listeners of Jeff Norton's program tonight, out there on the midnight ocean, wherever your ship is floating right now, I would say you need to look at everyone around you and look for the good in those people and help that to grow a little every day. Watch for it. Look for it. Because even the person at the, at the convenience store that, that lets you swipe your card and not get a receipt for your donuts and coffee in the morning, every single person needs that love you have inside of you. you got to give it to them. That is what will change the average consciousness of the planet. I sincerely believe that. Wow. Don't you, Jeff? Oh, I, without a doubt. I mean, I, I'm, I'm imagining as you're speaking, I'm, I'm engulfed in your words, and I'm imagining a world in which that is that is the case. But it can happen. It can yeah. happen tomorrow morning at seven o'clock when you go get your gas in the morning. That's how fast it can happen. Wow. Yeah, I, I had a real good friend, a British friend, who once said it's easier to get someone to sweep your or it's easier to get someone to save your life than it is to sweep your floor. And I always asked him, is like, what, what you know, some saying, some British English saying. And he said, Look, it's easier, you know, it's the easy stuff that we, we forget to do. I mean, yeah, I mean it it, it you're absolutely he's absolutely right. It's it's that we're worried about the big stuff and the easy stuff is sitting right there in front of us. You know, well, to take the know, time. People will often come back and say, well, yeah, but how long do I have to do that? Well, see, that is the attitude that destroys the world. Yeah. What really should be the attitude is how long do I get to do that? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, how, how long do I have? How much time? Do I still have enough time to do this enough? Hmm. And the answer is, yes, you do. Hmm. That is... You know, it, what comes to mind when you when you said that was a I, had a, I have a rabbi friend, he, he's he's long past, but he told me, he said, the thing about death, he said, the only bad thing about death is the fact that you don't have knees to ask for forgiveness anymore. And, uh, and you know, I'm thinking about that. That's the thing is that, you know, when you, it, you're absolutely right. Uh, it's the, the thing about death is that you don't have the opportunity anymore to change anybody else's life. Or to say a kind word to them that might make them feel better about themselves and do do that is that's powerful stuff, man. It is so powerful. And I think it's it it falls back to you know, you go back to the scriptures just for a second. I hate to, yeah. to get all preachy, but no, I, go I'm, ahead. Not, I'm not. Uh even the apostles had a hard time with all the commandments and, you know, which do you do? And gosh, which is greatest? I don't know. So he goes to Jesus and I forget which apostle it is, but he says, master, which is the greatest commandment? I mean, this is a smart guy. You should be able to tell me what's the greatest. If I can get the greatest commandment, right. I'm sure I can get everything else. Yeah. I'm sure Jesus could have listed off a whole list of things, but he said upon these hang all the prophets and the commandments. Now, you got to remember, this was written in Greek, so I'm going to read it just the way it was written, and then I'm going to say it the way it was meant. Yeah. He said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, might, and mind, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt not love thy neighbor as thyself. Well, Greeks often write things as a syllogism. They state the conclusion and then the premises. So let me read it in the way that it actually makes sense. My mother used to tell me, Brooks, straighten up and fly right. <laughs> so what the heck does that mean, <laughs> mom? Straighten up and fly yeah. right. What do you what do you mean? Yeah. Okay. What did he mean? This is what he meant. Look, 
Upon these hang all the prophets and all the commandments. Love yourself. And then love your neighbor like you love yourself. And by doing these two things, you will be loving the Lord your God with all your heart, might, and mind. Hmm. You cannot love God unless you love yourself. And you cannot love your neighbor if you do not love yourself. Hmm. Let that one sink in for a while. Yeah, let that sink in. It makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. Just look at yourself and say, you know what? I don't like what I see. Well, be like the sculptor. Carve away the things that aren't Jeff Norton, and what's left will be perfect. Wow. That is... Because there's no other. You're original. Yeah. They broke the mold when they made you, buddy. <laughs> well, I think they broke the mold when they made all of us. That's what I mean. Yeah. Each I, and every one of us is the absolute perfect replica of yeah. ourselves. Yeah. So stop trying to be like everybody else. You know, I've heard that a couple times. I mean, that's the message for me today. I've heard that a couple times today, by the way. It must be resonating. It, there's something resonant. You know what? It, it, yeah, and I know exactly where it goes. I know exactly. I know exactly what why I'm getting that message. There you're you you're about the third person that I actually heard that that same line today from. Well, when it gets to eight, a golden egg is going to drop out of the air. Is, is that how it is? Yeah, <laughs> because eight. You know, when I was interviewing people for the book. Uh, I asked uh, uh, pro baseball players that came up out of the minors. Yeah. I asked them, how many times did you try out to get into the pros from the minors? Yeah. And they had to think for a minute, but then they said, I think it was, I think it was my eighth outing. I finally made it to the majors. And then I asked a pro golfer who'd played the pro am circuit for a while. I asked him, how many tournaments did you play before you went pro as a pro am? He said, I think I played eight, about eight tournaments, and then I was in the zone. I could I could do what I did mm -hmm. like a pro. And the same thing with real estate sales. How many houses did you sell before you actually became a realtor? Because it's kind of part-time till then. Yeah. It was eight. Everything was eight. So when wow. you go back and look at the iterations of how the golden mean works and how things begin to gel as self-regenerative, like a proton, you divide the seventh number into the eighth and you always get 1.618 to one. And it's actually good to the fourth decimal place, which is pretty amazing when you consider the error uh, going out to infinity. That's very small. That's a perfectly straight line. Yeah, that's pretty. That's what we call a great R fit. Gotcha. No, I, I yep. I'm I'm thinking. I'm actually so I'm sitting here. <laughs> so I'm sitting here going, all right, how many shows have I done? <laughs> well, <laughs> how many more do I have ahead of me? You know what? I, I, I'm going to share. So I think I shared this with with another guest. When I started, actually, Amy Coelho, my second guest, when I started doing this show, number one, about two weeks before doing this show, I had two very good friends. One of them uh, does a, a, a podcast during the day, and he's like, Jeff, you got to get back on the air. We miss you. You know, we you got to get we got to get you back on the air somehow. Whatever you want to do, use my use my network, use whatever. Um, but we got to get you back on the air. And then another friend said, hey, look, I got equipment that's just sitting here. I'm going to send it to you so you don't have to make the capital invest. I'm just going to send you all the equipment I got and and everything. So that was message one. Message two about that night, that night or two, uh, a few nights later, I had a dream that I was standing in front of the NAB building in downtown Chicago. That's, you know, the the National Association of Broadcasters. <laughs> But I couldn't get in, and they wouldn't let me in. I I was, like, locked out of the thing. And, and so I shared that with Amy, 
and she's a dream interpreter. And she said, well, and I thought it was like, well, you'll never be good enough. Right. That was the interpretation I got there to join the big boys. And she's like, no, she goes, what it is, is saying that you need to do this, but you need to do it a different way. You don't need to look at old radio. You don't need to look at the at, at mainstream radio as your way in to, to do this market. And the reason why I bring that up is because the messages today that you said revolved around that right there, because I am working with a syndicator to get syndicated. And the message I got is be yourself. And, well, you know, that and, and you're, you know, you hit it on the head for me again tonight is the fact that I need to just stay and do what I'm doing. Maybe that's the synergy that you were talking about earlier today. We talked earlier today, yeah. kind of, kind of made this uh, appearance up yeah. at the last minute. But we believe in synergy. We believe yeah. there are no such thing as 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 coincidences. Yeah. Pieces get put in place when they're supposed to get put in place. Correct. And uh, is, are there other things I could have been doing tonight? Uh, no. But <laughs> <laughs> the point is that I was ecstatic about coming on Jeff Norton's wow. program. I I just I'm. I'm would rather not do anything. I don't know if that came out right or not because it's uh, one o'clock in the morning. Actually, it's one eleven. One eleven. Yeah, that's pretty auspicious too. <laughs> uh, the point is that that we're coming together and we're making a message mm-hmm. that somebody out there is listening to and somebody's writing. In fact, I, I just somebody just wrote me on Skype and said, "I think that is an awesome message." I don't think. That person's alone. I think there are other people in the chat room doing the same thing. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, it, it yeah. I, well, without a doubt, with, with, without a doubt, is that uh, people are going to have an aha moment when they hear this show. I hope. And that's our goal. That's the goal. I, Absolutely. I, I did. I, I, I had it when you, when you were, when you were talking about how many times have you heard that, you know, the golden rule kind of thing? We all hear that. But the way that you you said it, um, and the way that you put it, it, it did resonate. It did. I, I use that word. It, it definitely did resonate. Well, there there are all kinds of people out there that do good things for other people. I mm-hmm. mean, just just look at the Democrats. They'll do it any day. Well, as long as the cameras are running. Yeah. Um, but yeah. it is about loving yourself first, correct? Because you can sense it. When yeah. you step into an elevator with someone you don't even know, they haven't said a word to you, you can sense it right away. Yeah. If that person loves themselves, you can feel the energy coming off that person, yep. even if they don't say a word. Yeah. Or even or or even an area. I, I'll tell you, when I was in Chicago, I mean, I loved, when I first moved to Chicago in 97, I loved it. I loved the vibe. The city was alive. It felt good. It was great to be in Chicago. I I thought I would never move, ever. And one day, uh, one day in in May, I woke up and I had that little voice in my head that said, "Move, pack your bags and move now." You got to listen to that voice. And needless to say, a month later, Sandy and I were down in Florida. And I, I love it here. I wake up every day with that vibe going on. Yeah. And then I listen to what's going on in Chicago with the violence and with, and I talk to my friends and they're like, it's kind of like the city's got like a gloom overhanging it. It's like a negative energy. And I'm like, it does. I was up there three weeks ago, four weeks ago. I was on South Michigan Avenue, uh, doing some business at the, at the good old, uh, uh, tower. Yeah. And, um, the Willis. yeah, Willis Tower. Oh, yeah, Sears Tower. Call it what yeah. it is. It's Sears yeah, Tower. You, Sears Tower. Yeah, come on, guys. It's Sears Tower. I don't care about the, the new owner or the new sponsor. It's yeah. Sears Tower. Um, but anyway, when I got done with my business, I had a meeting the next afternoon. So I decided to go uh, over on, you know, 6th Street and yeah. do some singing. 
Okay. So, yeah, I went out and uh, sang that night and had a blast. The place was packed. Enjoyed the heck out of it. Walked back to the hotel, back up to 11th Street, which is about eight blocks, two blocks over and five blocks up. And it was fine. You know, the park, that's the park district. So yep. the park is across the street on Michigan Avenue. It's a great park. And there's all yeah. kinds of people walking in the park at night, all hours of the night. Yep. And I never saw any violence whatsoever. I love Chicago. Chicago rocks yeah. all the time. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I do. I, 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 I love, I mean, I love it. it. It's, I guess the thing is, is that, um, I just had that bad feeling. It was like move. Uh, you know, it was uh, when I first lived there, like I lived, you know, where Grant Park is. When I first moved sure. to Chicago, I lived in the high rise building that is, it looks like the clover leaf. You can see it right off of Burnham Harbor. So it's like right. a clover. It's like, well, it's a three, it's a three leg crew. So I lived right there. I mean, I remember, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, my sailboat was right there in Burnham Harbor. I mean, everything. I, I, like I said, I, you thought I was going to be mayor of Chicago <laughs> the way I was. I, I, I love that city. There was nothing like it. And, um, I always thought that I was going to hit radio when I, you know, in the back of my mind, I was like, hey, I'm going to get on WLS one day. You know, I'll be on WLS. And, uh, and, it, you know, it's it just, but like I said, I just woke up one day and it was like, move. Uh, it was literally, it's kind of like, uh, you know, I, I'm one of these people, uh, we talk about ghosts on the show. And when a ghost, when I hear that voice get out, I'm gone. I'm not sticking around. I don't, I'm not going to meet you. (laughs) Yeah, I am gone. And it's, I got ghost hunters that are like, Jeff, you're going to go ghost hunting with us. I'm like, okay, as long, but you're going to see a six foot six giant run quicker and move quicker than you've ever seen. If I hear a voice that says, get out. And (laughs) so, but you know, and I did. I heard that voice, you know, saying "get get out of this, get out of Chicago." And uh, you know, we go, moved here to go Florida. south, young man. Yeah. Well, you know, I have to say, there's something about. Look, I mean, there's. Uh, how do I say this without? I don't want to be negative towards anybody. Um, there's something about the Southern lifestyle. Number one, that you can't that you can't explain. Uh, that's one. Number two. For me, being close to the ocean, to the Gulf, is rejuvenating. Sure, I I, yeah. I can't tell you how much how great it feels to sit out in the sun, in salt water, and, and just go oh, and and then also have the fact we're in Nature Coast. We're in the, what they call the Nature Coast. So we're mm-hmm. we're we're north of Tampa, south of Jack. You know, Jack, we're along the Nature Coast, and it is. I've seen I've seen black. You know, a lot of people are like, "Why you move there?" I've seen black bear. I've seen deer. I've seen wild turkeys. I've seen you know all the fishing. We already talked about it. This is truly nature's coast. And this is truly you can see pretty much anything you want to see down here. I, I think of the original settlers that came here when the original compact came over. Mm-hmm. They were supposed to land in a certain spot. They had a charter yeah. to land in a certain spot that the king had given them. Well, they arrived there, and it was a mosquito-infested, muddy, <laughs> wow. nasty mess. And so they decided, and really this was the spirit of America talking for the first time, you know what? Let's just sail a little bit further north and see what what it's like. Yeah. So they get up around uh, uh, Plymouth Rock, and the water is crystal clear. The trees are straight and tall. And so they decide to land there. So they figured that since they landed in a different place other than what was contracted with the king, that they could pretty much do what they wanted to do. Yeah. But then winter came. (laughs) And I would have said, if I was in that little party and made it through the winter, I would have said, come on, baby, we're going south. We're going back south. Exactly. I would have headed on down to Florida. And while those guys were chopping logs and making log cabins, I'd be making a fire, cooking a fish out on the beach and looking at the stars. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one thing, one thing Florida that does have is the no seams. Those things will tear you up. Yeah. But they didn't have them back then. They didn't. No, I made my mind up that back then they didn't have. They didn't have. Okay, it, it well that's good. Glorious back then. They they were okay. They were they were some bio research yeah, lab that they were, they were imported from somewhere. 
Yeah, back in there in the in the original times, it was a perfect paradise. Those are those are evil monsters. When I the <laughs> first day here here here's a here's a great story. Here's a lesson. Here's God telling you to 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 cool your jets. So the first day we get here, Sandy and I drive. You know, we unpack the we unpack the uh, the moving van, and we're literally like a mile from the from the Gulf. And so we get in the car and we we drive down to go to the to the to the Gulf. And I get out with a video and I'm doing like my little ha ha. I'm in Florida bit. And Sandy's like, "Well, I'm saying she's from Florida originally." So her father moved to Tennessee to work at Nissan. My dad retired from the Air Force to go work at Nissan. And that's how we met. So the the funny thing is, is that I'm sitting out there and she's like, no, no, I'll stay in a truck. And I'm like, but how can you <laughs> not do better? Yeah, I'm, I'm in shorts. I'm like, I'm in shorts. You know, this is nice. And I'm watching the dolphins play in the, in the little cove there. And I'm taking the videos and I'm doing all of that. And I get back into the truck and no sooner than I sit down, I just start scratching. I'm just like, what is it? And she looks at me and she goes, oh, yeah, no seams. And I'm like, what do you mean no seams? And she goes, yeah, you don't see them. And, I, right. and, I, and she, right she goes, screen. She goes see, that, see that like little cloud right there? And I look out and you can see like a little cloud of these little gnats. And I'm like, oh, and she goes, oh, yeah. I was so tore up. These little buggers, they don't bite you, by the way. You have an allergic reaction because they, they urinate on you when they land on you. And, and that's the, I found, I'm an expert on no seams now because I've done everything, tried every remedy, and uh, they love me. And now they kind of leave me alone. I think it's because I've been here a while and you know, maybe my skin doesn't taste different or, you know, it tastes like everybody else. I'm not a delicacy to these guys anymore. But uh, I find they don't bother you if you pour beer on yourself. Is that what it is? I've heard, yeah. man, I've heard so many remedies. <laughs> Let me tell you, I'm going to give you guys the secret. Number one, stay away from them to begin with. You buy yourself whatever deep product. I don't care if you're going to have three eyes or whatever, whatever birth defects you're going to get from using a deep product. It's well worth it not to get eaten up by these things. Um, because I was so bad that I is like, I got to go to the hospital and get a steroid because I was scratching my skin off. It was, it was brutal, brutal. And you know, the, it was funny because the, the doctor was like, I can give you a steroid and I'm not a big fan of that, but I was willing to take it. Or she's like, look, go down and get yourself no joke. And this is, and this is a public service announcement for anybody that comes to Florida that gets eaten up by no seams and you, and you just can't, the scratch, get yourself Vagisil wipes. It is the, it is the, and that goes for any mosquito bites. Mm -hmm. And I tell all my friends, we, we keep it here because it's the strongest anti itch that, that you can ever get without. It's actually stronger than what a doctor could prescribe you. If that makes sense. Stronger than hydrocortisone. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. And it will, it does. It works. I mean, it, oh, it saved my life. I mean, I was doing four or five uh, 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 Benadryls. I was doing the 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 the, the pink stuff. Mm -hmm. I was taking the oatmeal bath. I was doing it all. I mean, I went through. I was miserable the first week that I was here because I these freaking no seams. <laughs> and it wasn't until I went to you know I talked to a doctor and she's like, look, she was here last. She goes, go down, go get yourself the Vagisil wipes. And you just wipe those, and those, those that has the strong that has stronger medicine than I could prescribe you. And I will tell you, it is just it's awesome. Now my buddies give me when I it's in my fishing box, it's in my tackle box. I get the cream too, so when you get bit by a mosquito or something along the cove, if you're inland fishing, they you know that goes on immediately. And uh, yeah, it's very interesting, very interesting, good stuff. I know. Uh, I put together survival uh, survival kits, and in them I usually recommend pink eye powder, yeah. which you can get at the hardware store. It's uh, it's to cure pink eye in animals, but it's a very very strong topical antibiotic, yeah. and you can put it on lacerations. If you can't get them stitched up in time in the wilderness, it can kill you. Mm -hmm. So you put pink eye powder on it, and that'll keep it from getting infected. There's a lot of them. Well, you're a survivalist, so you know this. I mean, well, as a Boy Scout. 
there's a lot of things you can go to your your uh your tractor supply or anywhere that you mm-hmm. know and and get a lot of antibiotics there's there's uh you can get vaccinations you can get a lot of things procaine penicillin Pro, yep you can get the penicillin the the big one go to your fish supply store and if you need if you're a survivalist you can buy the penicillin right off the right off the shelf right there at the uh, fish store so it, yeah it's 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 amazing but uh wow can you believe we've chewed through almost two and a half hours three and a half hours well that's only minutes you mentioned nissan you know that's what that was the first plant i worked at i was on the ultima launch i was on okay here you go i worked at me i when i graduated high school we had a real good friend who uh I'll just say their last name, uh, Nash, that got me a job at Nissan. And, well, it kind of helped that my closest friend in high school, his father was a VP there. And so I got a job at Nissan, went through, you know, the training, and I worked on the truck line, and then they moved me over to the Ultima line. I was on I was on the trim line. And oh, I did. You, you worked in uh, trim and chassis. Trim and chassis, night shift. Yeah. Yep. Cool. And I did that. And I was on. It's funny that you say that. See, so we might have bumped into each other because I was on that. I was on the Ultima team. That was when that came out. I was. I got. They moved me from the truck over to the Ultima. And I then, managed the powerhouse when we expanded for the new paint line and the Maxima. Well, okay. Because the thing was, is I went from trim and chassis over to paint. <laughs> well, I was the one that uh, that uh, handled the expansion for uh, the uh, dual temp water and switch gear and compressed air for okay uh, that expansion. Gotcha. I got, well, I will tell you, uh, two year. Everybody thought I was crazy when I left. I I worked there for two years, and I hated every minute of it. Really? Yep. Well, you made good money and you had the best health plan in the South. Oh, I made great money. And I, yeah, everybody thought I was insane when they were like, uh, can, can you believe I that? left because there was no four year university that would teach chemistry within driving distance of Nissan. And, um, 88 miles away was Tennessee Tech. Yeah. And uh, after they set all the switch gear there, Siemens and the group went to the next plant, which was Textron, a great big, huge, I think top 100, uh, Fortune 100 company. Sure. Uh, and they needed a plant engineer. And so they asked the guys who were putting in the switch gear, you don't know anybody who knows anything about the switch gear, do you? And they said, yeah, we know a guy who works at Nissan, but I don't think he'll move. And, uh, they, they kept making offers. And finally they said, listen, Tennessee Tech's across the street. We'll pay yeah. for you to finish your chemistry degree. And that's why I left Nissan. Yeah. So are you a PhD? Yes. PhD in chemistry physics. or physics? physics. Now my my bachelor's Doctor. is in chemistry, and then uh, statistics slash quality was the mother of an of an, of necessity gotcha. in man, in manufacturing. Yeah. You have to be in Six Sigma, which yep. is basically all those statistical tools, yep. and you learn how to master them in in a manufacturing environment. So that was the master's degree, and then I uh, stayed in school for two and a half more years and finished the PhD in, in physics, but I was working full time. So this, these were extension classes, much harder to do. I might add than <laughs> actually going to class. Yeah. Um, because you have to be a self starter. You take the same test, you go through the same textbook, but you got to kick your own butt through those books. But yeah. I had really good study habits and I graduated in the, the top 1% of math students in the country. So I was able to get through the physics. The, in, in the, at the end of the day, all I really wanted was the knowledge. Yeah. And that's what I got. Well, uh, it- when I got the diploma, I was really proud of it, but no one else was. Yeah. It, oh. it, they called it a diploma mill and all kinds of other insulting things. So I scratched the PhD off my resume and I said, fine, I'll just keep the knowledge and you can have the diploma. You earned it. I mean, it, it's, it's funny because, you know, my, my brother is five years ahead of me. Um, he got his, his aerospace engineering degree, his undergrad there at middle. 
which they were known for aerospace. And then, oh yeah, big aerospace. College. Instead of Emory, yep. And then, uh, then he went to University of Tennessee Space Institute there in Tullahoma, and that's where he got his graduate work done. And then since he's Michigan State, you know, I don't. He's he's got he can wallpaper his walls. And I know that University of Tennessee and Tennessee Tech, they were kind of at you guys were competitors. I guess I I remember hearing that is that oh it's either Tennessee Tech or so highly highly recommended schools. Yeah. Oh yeah, and, Tennessee and so, Tech is uh, one of the top engineering schools in the country. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I graduated in the, with honors from there. And uh, actually, the 84th largest corporation in the country, W.R. Grace, hired me two months before sure. I graduated. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that's incredible. Yeah, my brother was, he was in propulsion. So that's what he did in aerospace. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, University of Tennessee, especially with their, down there with uh, uh, Redstone, and uh, he did a lot of work for McDonnell Douglas and Morton Thiokol and, and those guys, he is. I think his uh, his uh, graduate paper thesis was on uh, propulsion. He actually designed a chamber here on Earth that could simulate space, and they can test different fuels. That's here, cool here on Earth. Which, yeah, that was his. So he he did some pretty cutting edge research, and that yeah, brilliant guy. Now he's he's doing alternative energies. He's not even in the yeah aerospace. exactly. Yeah. Well, I, I did uh, two co-ops for JPL when I was lived in Pasadena. Mm -hmm. I graduated from San Marino High. And uh, then I went in the Air Force. My friend, who I was friends with all through high school, he stayed there. And then he ended up going to work for Hughes Satellite and ended up putting all the GPS satellites out there. And yeah. So now, now he works for Anderson as a consultant. Now, who, Hughes, aren't they, isn't it Bell now? Who's the jar, the Mason jar, or is it Mason? Isn't that Hughes now? Mm, I'm not really sure. I know Hughes, Hughes Net and Hughes Satellite is is still there. Yeah. They're still a big company. But the company that actually makes the satellites, I believe it, it's called it, it's it's the Mason jar. It's actually the same company that makes your Mason jars, which is kind of it's a huge stretch. But they were they were bought out, and uh, it's all it's it's amazing. It's amazing stuff. I mean, hats off to the you know, the Project X guys. I, I being here in Florida, we we love it. We were devastated when that rocket blew up on the pad, yeah. which which they're now saying that it might have not been, uh, uh it might have not been a uh, a defect. It might have had help. Hush, yeah, hush. I I think that uh, we're very close to making private inroads to going back to the moon and and harvesting helium three yep. and and doing some amazing things up there but i i honestly don't think it could be done one nation at a time no i think we have to figure out how to learn to live as earthlings and i'm not a globalist by any means i'm just saying we need to take care of this seed of lucifer problem that we have and yeah. do it very quickly or we're not going to make it. We're not going to. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, that's the thing too. We got to get our parties. I mean, what do they say? A, a cubic cubic foot of H3 is enough to power any any major city for a year? Well, I don't know if it's that little, but it's a darn little amount, about a shipping container. Yeah. But the, the nice thing about an H3 reactor is there's no radioactivity. There, yeah, there's nothing. It's, it's even better than cold fusion. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing, and it's sitting right there on the moon, and that's it's crazy. Well, we don't even... For my money, I would go to the moon and use the H3 to make a moon base. <laughs> well, some say that there's already a moon base there. You just got to occupy it. Well, I'm, I, I, I'm I not a, one of them. <laughs> I, well, I mean, what? All right, so here we go. You're a physicist. You're a learning man. What? What do you? How do you explain the fact that the moon, when they shot the, when they did the Apollo 13, shot the, you know, the the lander back after off the command module, the the moon rang. It had resonance. Yeah, it did. They had the 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 mission for those of you listening. They had been trained in geology and they had actually put geological listening devices on the moon, embedded them into the soil. Yeah. And then when the eagle took off, once the fuel was expended, they jettisoned the fuel tank. Well, the fuel tank was just an aluminum can. It fell back to the moon very slowly. But when it hit the moon, those geological devices measured vibrations 
for an hour. Yeah. That's how long the moon rang from that impact. So a lot of people are saying that the moon is hollow. Yeah. Of course, I, I still have a great hypothesis out there that planets form as hollow spheres. Not enough evidence to prove it, but one thing I'm really happy about is there's not enough evidence to disprove it. Exactly. Well, and, and that was the other thing. Well, then they, it's my understanding that after they did that, they, they, they intentionally shot a rocket at the moon and it resonated for like a week. They did. They did in 2006. Uh, yeah. They launched a 2,200 pound slug at the pole of the moon. And the reason they did that is because they had a spectrographic uh, probe that was watching the moon from an equatorial position in orbit. And it could then see across the pole this huge plume of material jettisoned into space and it could spectrographically analyze it, which it did. And they actually found quite a bit of water in the soil of the moon. Wow. That's, see, I didn't, I haven't heard that one. And then the, you know, the other one too is, is the argument for the moon being a solid something, solid iron or whatever is a fact. And I didn't, I, you know, you look at the moon, you look at the, the craters, they said no matter how big the crater is in its diameter, its depth, regardless if it's a small crater or big or big meteorite, whatever hit the moon, the depth of the crater, they're all the same. Yes, they are. So they said there's obviously something below the surface that is keeping that meteorite or whatever hit the moon, if something did hit the moon, from actually, you know, being deeper than there. Everything's consistent across the board. But we also have good pictures of ancient volcanic vents on the moon, and they're quite round, by the way, and very deep. And I would go up there and probe those. And if I was going to build a moon base, I wouldn't build it on the surface of one of those craters and be waiting there like a sitting duck. I'd go down in those volcanic vents, cap that thing, and make my base inside the moon. Yeah. Well, you're going to have to run out whatever creature's in there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you. The Nazis, right? The, what was that classic movie where the where the, the Nazis? Dark sky. Yeah, dark. Yeah, yeah where the Nazis dark. migrate. That thing. That's that, a great movie. You know, that's what always fascinates me. I, I hate to say it, but I'm gonna say it. That's the thing that fascinates me about the Nazis. You know, you you hear them with the technology. Forget their travel. You know, look, they're evil people, and please don't say Jeff is a Nazi. Jeff's, but. I mean, from a technology, I mean, you hear stories about them having an Antarctica, you know, a, a submarine base that had 19 submarines in it. They they built underground bases and and the technology. I mean, most of the technology that we use today is based, obviously, based upon what they were doing back in the 40s. And this is prior, no CNC machines, no, you know, they were still doing everything with a slide rule mm -hmm. and, and they were machining equipment. Uh, one of the coolest pieces of equipment that I ever had was a lathe that was made by a German that was on a German U-boat. Wow. I had this lathe. Sandy was like, I cannot believe you bought this thing. And, and I was like, but you don't understand. This thing was made. This was on a German U-boat and it was made by, and you know what? That lathe cut better than any, I mean, it was a hand lathe. Uh, you know, but was for a hand lathe, they cut better than any CNC lathe I ever used. I mean, it was, it had the old belt that you had mm -hmm. to get the different RPMs. You had the different belt adjustments and the different, yeah. Old, yeah. I would drill press just like that. Yeah. And this thing was on a, on a U-boat. It was on a, on a summary. It was, and it was, oh, it was handmade too, by the way. It wasn't, you know, someone made it. The, the motor on it was hand wound. And I love that lathe. I love that lathe. And uh, unfortunately, I had to sell it. Amazing stuff. Amazing stories. Yeah. Good times. Good times. That was, I had to make room to move to Chicago. We only had, from Chicago to here, we only had a <laughs> truck. I, I left back a CNC machine. I gave it to a friend of mine. Yeah. See, when I move, the only thing I take with me are the clothes on my back and my motorcycle. Well, that, yeah. I get to the new location. I buy everything new. Yeah, that was well. We took. I mean, we 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 said when we moved, we had a a, a twenty five foot uh, truck, 
that was it. And we said, get everything that's important to us in that truck, everything else, give away or sell or do whatever. And that's, yeah, I had a CNC, a four axis CNC machine that I gave wow. to a buddy of mine and said, here. Can't could, put that on a truck. Could not put that on a truck. <laughs> that would have taken up the truck. Yeah. And uh, so, no, I, and you know, my friend is still using it to this day. He's like, thanks. But, uh, but yeah, that was my. I, I I'm a, I love CNC stuff, and it's funny that you talk about statistics. I'm all self taught uh, self taught statistics. Uh, everything, all my patents, all my forty air, all my uh, brake fix models, and all the things that I developed were all me just finding a book and and learning from going to the university. I'm one of these guys going to the university and saying, "Hey, look, I know you're an expert in this. I, I'm this is what I'm trying to build, and all my data modeling and and stuff that was all self taught." And uh, I'm like, I'm not going to sit wow. in an English class. They get a I'm degree in math. That. Every bit of coding I ever learned, except for ladder logic, I learned by just going to Google and yeah. learn, learning the HTML and the CSS. And, you know, necessity is the mother of strange bedfellows. I yep. know what I want to do. Yeah, I could hire a webmaster to do it. But then when he leaves or doesn't, answer the phone at two o'clock in the morning. Why? Well, I have no idea, but, but uh, I have to do it myself. But so there's I no fun well do it myself. Think about it though. I mean, there, there's no fun in it. There's no, you know, just having someone else do it, it, it. It's not fun. You know, part of this is all a journey. Like I said, building my own logic gates for, for the sound that you're listening to right now and building those, those applications and learning how those things work and learning about, release and decays and stuff and sound is and uh I'm, it's impressive yeah i think we did a pretty good job one is we are going to offer this to to podcasters we're you know to help them we're going to put together some informational i'm probably going to show them some open source uh stuff that they can use um because i don't want to be responsible <laughs> for their for their audio getting jacked up in the middle of the show but uh we'll find some other open source products that they can use and uh, that have a little bit more reliability and and everything. But, uh, well, my friend, I think it's come to that time, unfortunately. Is there anything that we missed that we need uh, to cover? Well, yeah, there's a whole other set we could do for another another program. We could talk about energy and electric vehicles and, uh, and uh, why small business can't get off the ground anywhere in the country. It's all tied in together, and we could do a magnificent show on it if you want to. We absolutely. But I'm going to ask you this: Tesla, yay nay? Um, well, I know the guys that founded Tesla, and they are all a bunch of smart guys. Very good. I've been, visited their plant in Ann Arbor, Michigan, when they first got started. Mm -hmm. I was a little disappointed when uh, Elon Musk uh, went to the second round of funding, and then once he became a large enough shareholder. He did a hostile takeover, fired my 23 friends that started Tesla Motors and took over the company and made it into his cash cow. Now, I will say this about Elon Musk. He doesn't know anything about building cars, but that man can sell stock like no one, no one I have ever seen. I've, I've actually heard that from a few people. <laughs> From a, you know, from a, from a few it's people. kind of funny how people call him Tesla, but he is not no, Tesla. No. He's a hostile takeover artist that yeah. took over a company that was founded by Correct. some very smart engineers. Correct. I remember while well, my brother was working, he was living in Wixom and he was working for Ford, and he was he was one of their their quality guys at Ford. <laughs> and so I remember Tesla, and I remember I, I remember him talking about them, and because most of the guys that he ran into. Uh, we're, we're working there in Ann Arbor. Well, at, at we're, the we're glad that they beat the naked, naked short traders. Excuse <laughs> me. Because, uh, you know, Citigroup and the guys that were naked shorting uh, a Tesla Motors took a $2 billion bath, and it yeah. couldn't happen to a nicer bunch of guys. Had he not beat those short traders, he would have been out of business years ago. Yeah. I, th I don't think he's going to make it. I think I think they have it in for him, and they're just using these these crashes as the uh, the uh, the first crash actually happened about twenty miles from my from my house. The guy that was killed, the first one, where the truck, where the where apparently the optical system when the truck turned in front of him mm -hmm. didn't you know saw the white 
the panel and, and didn't think it was a truck and ran them right into the back That's of it. That's because vision systems will never work yeah. like that. Yeah. Nobody wants a self-driving car to do that. That's uh, why that's why we have a brake pedal. Yeah. You know, traffic fatalities have not gone down significantly since 2007. Yeah. Cars are as safe as they need to be. Yeah. Driving a car is dangerous business. What makes people die in car wrecks is drinking and speed. Yep. Oh, absolutely. No, no car will protect you above 35 miles an hour. They're not right. built to protect you above 35 miles an hour. Ours yeah. are, but theirs aren't. Yeah. Now, when cars were originally put on the road, and I mean in a serious mass production way in the early 60s, uh, traffic fatalities were up because they didn't have seat belts, they didn't have safety glass, they didn't have disc brakes, they didn't have radial tires, there were a lot of things that needed to be improved. Yep. But the market was going to improve that anyway. But here's what happened to the price of cars. First, they tripled. Then they doubled, and then they doubled again. Yeah. And the biggest debt bubble we have in the country right now is the auto loan debt bubble, and it's over a trillion dollars. Yeah. And here's the difference between it and the mortgage bubble. With the mortgage bubble, there was at least a first mortgage on a piece of real estate with a title. Yeah. With a car, there's nothing. Okay. That car is absolutely worthless. When yep. that mortgage crashes and they call that $35,000 note due, that car is junk. Yep. Nobody will buy it. Correct. Well, I mean, I should show you. I mean, when the minute you drive it off a lot, it's, it's already depreciated. The, the instant. Of, of course it is because the Department of Transportation is the one that has jacked the price of the vehicle up, not the car company. Yeah, because of all of the useless regulations. Yeah, I knew you were going to say that, and that's exactly correct. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm with you. I, mean, I, I, I get it. I, you know, so we, we can definitely have a whole another topic about that. But uh, it is, I, I, I don't. Uh, I hear your voice is, is letting go, and and I, I understand that uh, you're not yeah, used to. I haven't had any water. Yeah, uh, you know, we've been on. More hours than, uh, I mean, normally I speak for three hours, but sure. I have water and I, it's okay. I'd much rather speak late at night with you than, uh, sit here and, and, uh, watch my, uh, my website and make tweaks on it. Yeah. I, I was going to ask you, so tell people before we, about your, sh your radio show. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's called X squared radio. We're on the only night of the week that, that Jeff is not. And that is Sunday night. Uh, from 8 to 11 Eastern time. So it's not that late. It's a great way to cap off the week. Or if you want to look at it the way we look at it, it's a great way to start the week. Right. Because you get the news on my program and the way to analyze it and where to position yourself. So Monday morning, you know how the headlines are going to go all week because they listen to my program. Gotcha. I I'm going to be listening. Absolutely. I'm going to put you on your, on, on my, uh, and you, you, and you stay away from the, as well, you, you get in the esoteric, but you stay away from the ghosts and, uh, and some of that. Yeah. I don't do the ghosts. I, I rarely do conspiracy theories unless there are a lot of facts to back it up. Now, what I will do is take trends that are going out there off their own volition. They, they actually gain legs and they're false. And then what I'll do is say, listen, don't, don't be pulled in by this. Don't, don't go invest in this, you know, get your money out of that, put it into silver, put it into gold. Don't yeah. invest in this, get your money out of the bank, put it in a credit union. Those kinds of words of advice will position you in the right place so that when this thing comes flying apart, you can be around to help put it back together. Yeah. Yeah. Good advice. We'll, uh, we'll definitely get a link up there and, you know what? If you don't mind, can we refeed your show? Wow, are you kidding me? That'd oh, be awesome. Okay. Yeah, we'll definitely, we'll definitely. Re I'll, I'll reach out now. Do you? Obviously, do you you broadcast out live? Correct. Yeah, we go out okay. live. We take live callers, and uh, I have a great, great audience. They're very intelligent. They ask wonderful questions. Sure. They could be guests themselves. Half of them. Um, but we've been on for 12 years, and we take calls from Australia, from uh, Ireland, from West Coast, East Coast. And sometimes they just sit back and listen. 
Yeah. So, you know, if I, my, if I write my monologues, right. <laughs> they just sit back and listen. Yeah. That, that was one thing that we're, I always wanted to do a, like a more call in, but it's so hard to get people to call in. I mean, our listenership isn't up though. I mean, we're, we're still building the audience. Sure. I mean, we, we have some shows where we'll get a thousand or so downloads, a couple thousand, but for the most part, I, I think we're getting about three to 400 downloads, you know, per show. And well, that's, that's all about the network and it's about social media. You're doing the right thing with YouTube and with yeah. Facebook. That's, that's the key to yeah. making it right there. Yeah. And well, Facebook's beating us up right now. I spend two to three hours posting on about 76 different groups. And now they're now Facebook is coming back and, and telling and, and uh, reporting Facebook. It's not the group because the group administrator is like, why am I asking if this is okay to post? I, you can post on our group all the time. And what it is is Facebook is asking them if I'm spamming them. Oh, I see. And it's like, and, and, and these administrators of these groups are like, why, why is it asking me this, Jeff? <laughs> why is it? Because we, I do. I spend about each day, I spend, I send about 76. I go to each group and post. You know, there's about 70, you know, hey, these, these, this is our guest for tonight. Join us. And, and Facebook is starting to get, I don't know. It's just, it's, I, I know we're doing okay. I know we're, you know, when I, how do I say it? When I put this plan together, this is a 10 year plan, uh, a business model. That's a good plan. Yeah. We're, we're, and I told Sandy and we, we financed it or financed it for up to 10 years. And that's what we put in the bank. I mean, the only thing, the only way that's not going to work is that we don't have a physical location, which means sure. I'm homeless. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't we all? Yes, exactly. Just exactly. remember, uh, security begins with your left foot and ends with your right foot. <laughs> this is true. This is true, my friend. But, uh, well, I will definitely get the links. But send me the link to your MP3 that's generated for your show. I can do that. It's uh, free for a week, and then it goes into the archives, and it's replaced by the next week. So you always get fresh, okay. fresh content. Yeah. Uh, well, when you go live, do you do you generate? Do you go out to a shoutcast or icecast server? I I just call into the studio. The studio uh, handles all that stuff. I just generate the content. Oh, so you're actually on a radio station? Well, I'm on a webcast network. Oh, and that that network has. Uh, stations that it goes out to affiliates that it goes out to but it is uh that's most of them like blog talk or conscious yeah. media network or all that uh they they just have a network where they bulk by the time and then they resell it to the hosts and the hosts uh sink or swim you know basically if you can build your build your audience and uh pay for your airtime which to me it's a hobby so i just pay for my airtime yeah and uh build the audience it grows and it shrinks it depends on uh, the time of year, what sports playing at the same time that I'm on. Although I try to come on after the ball games, um, and uh, and what's happening, and you know who's listening. And I generally completely suck at social media. Um, I'm not I I have Twitter and I have Facebook, but I don't know how to use them. I'm sure I don't because whatever I'm doing, it's got to be wrong. Gotcha, gotcha, and and that that network is Truth Frequency, right? Yeah, Truth Frequency Radio Network. That's uh, there's 51 hosts on there. We pretty much cover almost 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Wow. Yeah, I was asked if I wanted to get on a on a network. It's tough. Network work is tough. The schedule's hard. The the content audience building you're competing with other hosts on the same network it is it's tough to do yeah i i, I would almost rather do it the way you're doing it lone wolf because then you don't have to compete with other people on the network yeah yeah i well it's one of these things. i mean we are changing our format one of the things i, I did realize that people don't want to come to our show and listen to me 30 minutes talk news they, they you know they want the guests they, they come to the show for the guests which is fine because that's exactly what I, I think the power of our show is our guests. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh, so we're, we are, as of tonight, actually, uh, I made the decision that, uh, that we're going to come right to the guests, you know, come in, introduce, boom, and then go right, right into it. Because we're finding, and our YouTube analytics, we're finding that our people drop off. We'll, we'll typically drop off within the first five minutes. 
of listening, but then they come back, you know, 30 minutes later. So they're, yeah, they're interesting. They're, yeah. They, they want the, uh, well, we're statistically, you know, I'm a numbers guy. So I'm looking at the numbers going, all right. So mm-hmm, they're, mm-hmm. they're not coming to listen to me talk <laughs> and, uh, they're coming to listen to the guests, which is fine. I don't care. I mean, that's yeah, all well, purpose. I like your format though. I mean, Thank a you. lot of, a lot of, uh, 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 programs I go on, they just say, okay, here's a quarter. And then I talk for 28 minutes. I never hear from them. They yeah. don't know how to ask questions. They don't interact. We, do, we don't have a conversation. Yeah. But that's what we're having on your program. Oh, I like it. Yeah. It's all about conversation. If I, one thing that we are doing right, I will tell you, I mean, we're, you know, we have you, we have Brad Olson. I mean, we have Dr. Heiser. I mean, we have uh, Lloyd Oberbach. I mean, a lot of top coast to coast guests and they all come back and they're like, that was an incredible show. You know, McCartney Green. Every Sasha, uh, Sasha was on the air when I got blown off because of the hurricane. Uh, you know, she's like, I got to get back on the show. And it, it's, it's because it, that's our format. It's a conversation. We're not, you know, it's not an interview. I don't, you know, it's a, a bunch of us talking and, and hopefully a few thousand people listening. And well, I recognized, uh, Maureen St. Germain. She was my, uh, my phase two and phase yeah. three meditation teacher for flower of life meditation she is a phenomenal woman i've traveled the world with her she's awesome she is she's given me some some guidance and i i will tell you she's great yeah yeah no, she, she she used to be and she probably still does this she used to be a corporate coach she'd be hired by big uh, corporations to come in and coach their managers wow so I didn't, yeah, I didn't know that. I, well, I knew that she had, well, I knew that she had different consulting services, but I didn't know exactly, you know, who she, we didn't get to that part of her, of her work. She's a phenomenally brilliant woman. Oh, really, really good. Did you listen to the interview that we did with her? No, Not I yet? just noticed, you know, your website when you invited me on today, I've got some, some making up to do. I'm going to go listen to a lot of your archives. <laughs> go listen to them. The, the, we're, I will have to say the last two weeks have probably, I mean, all of the shows have been good, but we've been, you know, please be generous when, when you're listening because the audio, we're working out our audio issues and, and we have a lot of technical things, but the, uh, you know, sometimes we're louder, sometimes we're softer, blah, 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 blah. But uh, I'll tell you the last two weeks have been just phenomenal shows. I mean, the, the audio, it's good to listen to in the ear. I mean, there's, you don't have me screaming at you. Or the guests. Some. Yep. So cool. Cool. All right. Brooks Agnew, sir, thank you. You thank are you very a, much for the opportunity. Oh, come on. Please. It's my pleasure. And you know, we'll get you back on. We'll talk a little bit more about electronic cars and 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 some of the other technology energy and 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 so I've got a lot more theories I want to run by you and everything. This, you know, kind of get a litmus test to see what, what you think about it. So it's one of my favorite things to do. <laughs> All right. Take care of yourself. Get some sleep. Be safe. And if it gets too crazy there in North Carolina, you, you know, you can always come on down. That's true. But it's, it's uh, starting to cool off a little bit down there. I'm, I'll make my way down there. I don't get down there when it's like 200 degrees like yeah. it has been this summer. Yeah. I mean, well, that's what Sandy's already booking trips to Puerto Rico. We, we tend, when it gets below 60 degrees here, we go to Puerto Rico for two weeks. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I hate you guys. Yeah. Well, we don't look, we're living on a budget. So it's one of those, but you just got a budget, right? And God provide. I'm a firm believer in that. God provides. If God didn't want me to go to Puerto Rico, he'd make sure the money wasn't yeah, in my see, bank there account. You go. That's exactly the way to look at it. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, that's, that's the truth though. I, I'm not, uh, you know, we're not where we're at in life because of anything I did. <laughs> It's, it, you know, God gives it when we, when he wants us to have it because he knows me. He knows that if he gave me any more than I deserve or wanted, he'd ruin you. He would ruin me. Yeah. I'd, I'd be driving a Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> you have an amazing week. Thank you. You too, my friend. Thank you for joining us. And so everybody, Brooks Agnew, I highly recommend. And I said that right. Brooks Agnew. So I do recommend get out there. Get out to our website if you can, our guest page. We have both of, we actually have all three of his books listed there. We have Earth, uh, Two Earths, One Race for a Time, and then The Grand Division, which is volume two, and then Remember the Future Physics of the Souls and Time Travel. 
So those are there. And we've also included a link to Brooke's uh, radio show on X2. And I do recommend that, you know, take a look, take a listen. Absolutely. I know I will be. You know what I'll be doing on Sunday night? I will be listening to my, I want to say good friend, <laughs> to my new friend, my newfound friend, Brooks Agnew. So like always, I just want to say thank you guys for joining us, for being part of the show tonight. I think is tremendous. You know, just to kind of recap, well, that was crazy with the cell phones. We will get those instructions posted up on the website. If you, if you really can't wait for that to happen tomorrow, uh, I will tell you that you can always rewind our show. <laughs> we gave you a couple couple times where it's there in the audio, so feel free to rewind it. Test it out. See where your cell phone is being routed to in your route list. That is incredible. That is crazy. I'm definitely going to be posting that on our channel. But once again, like always, like always, like we always say, be love. And my good friend, and oh, shout out, congratulations to Ed Roman, who won a uh, another award as an indie artist uh, last week in Nashville. And he's going to be on the show this, I believe it's Friday. No, it's next Friday. I get them mixed up. But Ed Roman's going to be joining us. And I do promise that we're not going to be talking about music so much and reminiscing about the good old days. We will be talking about his experiences in the paranormal and, and where a lot of his music is rooted in and from. But yeah, he'll be on the 30th. Ed will be joining us in, not in the studio, but he'll be joining us live from Skype from the great, great up north, Canada. He might be in Murphy's role by then because I know he's doing the in the artist of the year. But like always, I just want to say, remind everybody, thank you, Brooks, for joining us tonight. Thank you, listeners, for listening to the show. Take the time, if you can. Get out there and hit that ever so important subscribe button. The other thing, too, is like always, make sure be love.
Chapman on the Paranormal Radio Network.